Good morning. We are calling to order meeting number 269 of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission on May 23rd, 2019 at 10 a.m. at the Mass Mutual Center here in Springfield. We'll begin with item number three, the administrative update. Give Director Bedrosian, please. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was not physically at the meeting yesterday. However, I was in a different state. I did attend digitally and I managed to see the beginning of the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I know um, there were some questions uh, about mm -hmm. the preparations for the opening of Encore. And I just want to fill in some of the information. Um, I heard Mr. Ziemba talk about the preparation he and construction manager Delaney are doing on license conditions, which is vitally important to an operating certificate. The, the, the corollary side to that is a preparation for gaming operations um, that uh, Director Band, um, uh, our licensing director, Mr. Curtis, who's here today, and our other staff are preparing for. Um, I want to tell you that I think we're in um, very good shape. Um, it's going to be a very busy June. I don't want to underscore that. Uh, but uh, based on a lot of the expertise, we actually got out here last summer in Springfield. I feel uh, very comfortable that absent something unknown, that we will be ready to open, um, both with um, confirmation from Mr. Ziemba uh, on the license conditions and uh, with Mr. Band and the rest of the directors on the gaming operations, um, that we will be ready to open on June 23rd. Now, the process for that uh, would probably be a meeting the second week of June or so, where uh, it's a corollary to a meeting we actually had out here last August, uh, where all the directors uh, come before the commission and give you an update on the readiness. Uh, obviously, there's still some work to do between that meeting, the actual opening date, just like there was out here. And we'll ask the commission for designation, potentially, of a designee, one of the commissioners, to help the rest of the staff work through the rest of that time period from that meeting to the actual opening date, in which on the opening date they get a uh, conditional uh, uh, um, certificate of operations, which then once uh, it was, if there were any conditions on it, be brought back in front of the full commission probably the following week so the full commission could ratify it. Um, but uh, the overall uh, message I'd like to say is we have great staff to work in very hard. Um, we have just completed a gaming agent training program. Some of you might have attended parts of it. Um, it's, it's very interesting. If you've not seen uh, games being played or people cheating, um, it's, a, it's a great way. It wasn't just our gaming agents. It was our new uh, state and Everett police who were trained that also, who attended that also. Um, so as uh, absent something unexpected on the uh, gaming side, I would expect that we would be ready uh, to open June 23rd. So the last thing I'll say is I attended digitally and I saw Mr. Band was sporting a bow tie. He was. I said that was quite the look. He was. So I haven't seen that yet from you, Executive Director. For I am not a bow tie guy. So. So that's, that's it. So that's, uh, and usually, obviously, I would have done this in, in, in Boston, um, but uh, I, because I couldn't be there, I did want to follow up on that yesterday. I don't know if you have any questions. No, other than that, um, it sounds like we'll be setting the schedule for a few upcoming agendas. There was also a discussion about a few upcoming meetings, I, I, I meant. Uh, there was a discussion as to a potential meeting next week uh, in addition to the one you mentioned in mid-June. Yeah, so I think I heard also while I was watching that that we needed to follow up on some items from yesterday, next week? Next Wednesday. That's next right. Wednesday. And yep. then um, we will work on the next two dates in June. I, I, had, I had asked the commission, you were, you were grateful enough to say, we might have to do more shorter meetings just to keep the tempo going. Yes. And uh, appreciate the option to be able to do that. Yeah. Yep. That's necessary, too. Thank you. Moving to item number three, Ombudsman Ziemba, please. Thank you very much, Chair. 
Up for consideration today is a matter involving a community mitigation fund scholarship. I'm going to turn to Jill Griffin, Director of Workforce Supplier and Diversity Development, and Crystal Howard, Program Coordinator on this item. Um, and I'll just uh, say, uh, Crystal was recently promoted, so she's Program Manager. Um, congratulations. 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 Um, I'd also like to introduce Michelle Cabral, who is director of the Massachusetts uh, Casino Career Training Institute, to Crystal's right, and acknowledge that Jeffrey Hayden from Holyoke Community College is um, in the audience should we need any reinforcement um, or uh, questions. Um, so, um, as John mentioned, we're here to entertain a request for an amendment to the 2018 Workforce Development Grant um, awarded by the Commission to Holyoke Community College. Um, and um, by way of background, um, Holyoke Community College was awarded a total of $300,000 um, by the Commission. Um, and a bulk of that, $240,000, um, focused on culinary training, adult education programs, uh, high school credentialing for adults, career readiness, and English language classes. Um, all with the intent of um, advancing people in their careers. Um, a portion of that $60,000 was awarded for gaming school scholarships. Um, at the June 2018, June 7th, 2018 com commission meeting. Um, and I just want to um, actually add that this is a collaboration between Holyoke Community College, Springfield Technical Community College, the Springfield Public Schools Adult Education Program, and MCCTI. Um, so I'm gonna um, turn this, um, request over, or the program over to Crystal Howard to talk a little bit about the specific request um, that focuses on the gaming school scholarships. Thanks, Jill. So the request that came in from MCCTI is specifically for utilizing $7,500 of those scholarship funds to cover a course that currently has low enrollment and would be canceled otherwise. There are five students, are there five? We won't run it under five. There won't? Yeah, it won't be run under five, but those students will get this course for free and up and they'll take as many students as they can in the course. It will just be a minimum of, of five and they would all be able to take the course for free. So um, the specific request is covering the blackjack class instructor as well as the carnival games instructor, which are around $5,000 and a uh, recruitment manager for around $2,000 to help get that class up to five and above five, uh, as well as some a nominal amount for benefits and the CPR course. Um, I just wanted to note as well that they did let us know that the estimated total cost of running a blackjack and carnival games course is around $15,000, which includes the space, the equipment, and the related expenses and overhead. Um, so there's no cost, other costs associated, and a lot of that is in kind from um, MGM. Right? MGM, MGM yeah, so there's no profit built into the calculation for what they're requesting at this point. I'll hand that back to Jill. So um, staff analysis found that the proposed changes meet the general goals outlined and the original purpose of the funding um, regarding the gaming school scholarships. Um, they were intended to allow um, low-income Massachusetts residents um, advance in casino careers. And um, um, as each student would be um, allowed to receive this course for free, we thought it was very um, uh, aligned with the original purpose of the grant. Hi, can I ask a question about that? Is sure. the, um, the fact that the, the, there weren't enough individuals interested in taking the course, was that driven by cost or is there something else? Um, you know, Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, so I'd say we've got a couple factors going on um, and cost is the primary factor of why um, we um, requested the scholarship funds. So I do think that's a primary factor. 
combined with the fact that unemployment is currently low. So the people that we're going after to try to get enrolled in the class are currently unemployed or underemployed, and cost is a larger factor for that population. Okay. Do you have a um, sense of, I, I appreciate, I, uh, I do like this idea. Um, do you have an idea of, would this fold into the regular schedule of classes that you have upcoming, or what's the sense of timing to get these students through? Yes, yeah, so we have two classes that are starting. Um, we have a, a blackjack class that's starting on June 1st, and we're also trying, which is a weekend program, is something new we're going to try. And we have another class that's starting on June 3rd. I anticipate that if it's proof today, we'll use it for one of those two cohorts. Okay. And uh, the other question I had is uh, our partners in New England Farm Workers are helping to recruit and identify candidates, um, individuals who might be unemployed and Obviously, this would be a, hopefully a good opportunity for them. Um, if, if the case manager is focused on doing recruitment, that just kind of seems like we are finding students. Is there other things that the recruitment person or case manager is going to be doing on top of that? recruitment effort? Yeah, the, um, it's primarily recruitment. So it's making sure that they're going out to all the community-based organizations and letting them know about the opportunity that we have available. It's making sure that we're doing um, promotion through social media presence and we're tagging the right organization so um, we can ensure word is getting out. It's sitting with individuals who struggle to fill out the paperwork and to fill out the enrollment forms and therefore walk away and making sure that they get enrolled and they have a good first day experience so they can complete the class successfully. It's those types of activities. We um, appear with MGM at every career fair that we can um, that we can find within the area, and we're side by side with them, and um, so it would be more of that as well. Okay. And I assume that you're working with MGM, understanding what their needs are too. You know, there may be one particular area that they really need individuals, and, and another area they're really not having issues with attrition. Um, absolutely true statement. So MGM has assigned a liaison to work directly with me to come up with what the course schedule is. Um, his name is Peter Fox. Peter Fox and I um, chat on a daily basis to make sure that we're fulfilling the needs that MGM has. Great. I, I like the, the cost efficiency of it. I like the effect, you know, we, it'd be great to have you come back at some point and talk to us about the effectiveness and kind of what the results of the program. Obviously, it'd be great to land more than five students. Um, and obviously, if my understanding is students that successfully complete the program always have the MGM interview opportunity if they're successful. Correct. They complete two games, they get an audition, and the two games will be funded by this money. So it's blackjack followed by carnival games, and that would prepare them for the audition should they successfully complete the classes. That's great. I, I actually had uh, a similar question, but more, uh, more broad. I think, by the way, that um, this request is very modest, so I'm very much, in, and I'm very much in target with the spirit and the goals. Uh, that we set out before, so I'm very much in favor of it. Um, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, you know, a bigger picture, do you see some of these needs um, uh, increasing, uh, going a little bit forward? Uh, do you see some uh, good um, uh, success ratio of people that you train and, and eventually get not just an offer, but a, um, a job and some retention. Yes, yeah, so if you'd um, let you me speak? brag, I'd love yes, to. Could you, could so, you please speak to, um, um, to that, the, the overall program altogether? Yeah, so, you know, as Jill mentioned, um, we were awarded $60,000 in scholarship funds back when we were building the first set of cohorts to run through MGM. And in that time frame, so since February of last year, we've had about 370 people come through the school. About 89% of them have successfully completed the classes, and approximately 65% of them have been hired or been offered a position by MGM. If I peel all those numbers apart, day one opening, we had about 220 people come through the school. 162 of them had completed the requirements to get job offers and get hired by MGM. 
and as of March, 84% of them were still working at MGM. Um, we've moved the needle um, on workforce development as a result of the funds and as a result of MGM offering a new career opportunity for people in the region. Um, I believe that pipeline is going to um, continue to be there, so we just need to offer the opportunity to the folks in the region that can take advantage of it. Thank, Thank you. you for letting me brag. Well, <laughs> you can keep going. If, uh, don't, don't be constrained by time on, my, on, on, on our behalf. Numbers are really strong. Yeah, numbers Thank are you. important. That's great work. Um, Madam Chair, if I can, I'd move that uh, the commission approve the request to transition a total of $7,500 uh, from the scholarship al application allocation at MCCTI to cover the cost of two gaming instructors and temporary recruitment coordinator for a cor course that is currently low enrolled and would otherwise be canceled. Um, this money coming from the $60,000 that was allocated for scholarships um, in the 2018 Community Mitigation Fund Awards. Do we have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Catherine 5-0, please. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Keep up the good work. Next up for consideration you, is MGM Springfield's uh, quarterly report for the first quarter of 2019. Uh, we'll be joined here by MGM Springfield President Mike Mathis and his team. Good morning, Commissioners. Welcome Good morning. to Springfield. Good morning. Good morning. A little bit of a cloudy day, but I think the weather's finally breaking. Uh, excited to report on our, our Q1 um, results and also give you a little insight into some of the things we're working on for Q2 and the remainder of the summer. Uh, so without further ado, and I'll let uh, my te uh, the team members introduce themselves as, as we transition from section to section, if that's all right. So starting with our revenues. So as you can see, for the quarter, we generated $66.8 million in gaming revenue, generating $16.7 million in uh, taxes. Um, what I'm really encouraged by and, and the team is encouraged by is, is obviously the trend that you see represented in those three months. Um, seasonally, January is one of the more difficult months, uh, and that's borne out by our competitors and the numbers they report. So we knew with the weather, January would be challenging. February, of course, is a short month. It's just a function of days with 20, 28 days. Uh, and March uh, tends to be one of the better months um, throughout the season. We were benefited, as an industry, we were benefited um, in March for having five weekends. And the difference between a weekday and a weekend is also meaningful. So uh, can't claim uh, all the credit for the great results in March. Uh, because of those, some of those factors, but certainly what this represents for us is continuing to uh, fine-tune the operation, our promotional calendar, and responding to the customers. We, uh, we could, we've, we've launched now, I think, two different um, campaigns called um, You Said It, We Did It, where we take input from the customers and we, we make changes on the floor and we let them know that we've made them because of the feedback they've given us. And that will be an ongoing process. And that's what really excites us and that's what really differentiates the operators. Uh, you don't always get it right in the beginning and it's always an evolving process. And that's a little bit of the story of uh, the first quarter for us. Mike, Mike, could you give us an example of uh, maybe what you changed that people had requested? Sure. Uh, it's, it's, it's something as simple as expanding restaurant hours, for example. Uh, Early on, we didn't see a, a lot of demand for breakfast, for example. Uh, we turned on breakfast in, in, in one of our venues. We had a brunch um, based on uh, some feedback we got from our customers. And you know, part of it also in that case is making sure that the operation is stable enough 
to start expanding those hours. You want to make sure you have enough staff mm -hmm. and that the schedules are such um, that the kitchen is in, is in good enough shape to be able to take on that extra demand. Mm -hmm. But they've been very successful. We did a Valentine's brunch, for example, a Mother's Day brunch, all very successful. Uh, so on the food and beverage side, it's as simple as that, also changing some of our, of our offerings. Uh, on the gaming side, uh, I think I may have mentioned this in prior meetings, but it's always interesting to see what uh, what a certain um, market um, wants to see in terms of gaming products. So there's a there's a, a, black, a version of Blackjack called Let It Ride. It's not particularly popular in Las Vegas, but it's extremely popular here. And those early days, I know I was approached by a number of customers saying, when are you gonna bring Let It Ride, Let It Ride? And, and, and we're able to, through uh, your approval process, added that game, got the vendors approved, um, very successful. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really as simple as, as those types of um, those types of changes, and we're going to continue to make them. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Mike, is that a table game or a, th or a slot? It's a table it's game. It's a table game. Yep. Uh, the other thing I comment on March is uh, our, our slot performance in March was the best month we've had um, s since our opening. Uh, is f the total gaming revenue for March was just barely eclipsed by September. So a really strong month and, and something we're, we're really building on in terms of all the successes that we saw there. Uh, Mike, on that, on that note, um, and, and you know, just keep it general, um, how about other areas of, um, of, of the business? Uh, loyalty card customers, returning customers, how is that trend um, going? How is that going in general? Uh, very well. Uh, you know, our, our food and beverage uh, and hotel operations, our non-gaming operations, are well above our expectations. Uh, the, the hotel, for example, uh, we don't report that generally because it's not um, gaming related, but it is, uh, we're exceeding our occupancy. I think we're close to 90% occupancy. Uh, we're above $200 in terms of our average daily rate. Um, and, and what's really special about that for us is we track what the other hotels are doing. And what we predicted, you recall, was that if we built a relatively modest scaled hotel product, um, provided great food and beverage offerings, but not certainly not enough to feed the 10 to 15,000 customers we see daily, that you would feel that impact in the rest of the downtown. Uh, Red Rose Pizza has expanded their operation. They've added a second kitchen. Uh, the, the reports of their numbers uh, have never been better. Uh, there's been a new hotel opened, I believe a Holiday Inn Express opened when we opened. Um, there's now another hotel being added to the downtown. Uh, and uh, from all accounts, um, you know, restaurants are up 20%. The Sheraton um, is up on average daily rate as well as occupancy. So you can feel that lift and it's not surprising because we just can't house or lodge all the customers we bring each day and we certainly can't feed them all. You know, that's uh, just to add to that, and it's a great point, especially as we, I think, as a commission, look at what our ongoing research agenda should be. Um, and I know Director Vanderland is in the back of the room, but I think focusing on some of those details, meals tax, sales tax, all that's collected locally. Um, it's easy data for us to get. And if we looked at that, not only for Springfield, but for the surrounding communities, I think we could get a better picture what the overall impact is of your presence as well as what it's trying to do for the rest of the region. But uh, uh, I know we also have a meeting coming up with our friends at the Mass Office in Travel and Tourism, and they get the hotel information. And I think, to your point, that they're seeing bumps in room rates, you know, just because of the demand going up uh, is really helping out the greater region in this part of the valley. So. Uh, no question. Another interesting data point that we're starting to look at as well is we actually have a couple of vendors, for example, our, um, our alcohol distributors and others like that who I've had conversations with, and they're seeing spikes in their orders. So, they, you know, they told me don't let anyone cry, cry, cry poor in terms of the impact you're having because we're seeing spikes on our orders as well. So I think vendors are also a very interesting data point to see how they're impacted because that's obviously pretty, pretty true data. Uh, moving on to our lottery sales, uh, again, a, a, a similar trend, as you can see, uh, we're continuing to grow that business, and, and March certainly was a very strong month, so uh, we, we feel like we can do better. I, I've seen the Plain Ridge numbers, and they're extremely strong, so I, um, I'm happy to say I've got a great re relationship with the executive director, Mike Sweeney, who's been 
a, a, a real um, champion of our efforts here in Springfield. I'm a big fan of Executive Director Sweeney, um, and he's come out and visited the property, and we're, we're, we're continuing to innovate together on different promotions. We just, um, we bought a, a series of um, Boston Bruins lottery tickets that we gave out as promotions. Uh, it was his idea. He called me and said, hey, given the success of the Bruins, I think it'd be a really great promotion. And sure enough, we, we gave them away to our customers and it was one of our more successful promotions. Mm -hmm. So great example of partnering and, and, and working together. Has right. Director Sweeney uh, explained why he thinks uh, Plain Ridge has had that success on the host community overall even? I think it's a 25% increase in lottery sales. Of course, that's one of our mandates. So you guys, are you cross um, pollinating ideas to really bring it up and, and what was it what is it exactly do you think that has led to the success yeah you know we had that conversation I think he's he's trying to understand it as well um, right. I think they had a very strong existing um, support um, existing business okay. um, and it just got that much stronger so I think we, we were start a little bit starting from scratch um, excuse the pun so we, um, <laughs> we're, we're, but we're, we're trying to figure it out but in terms of Pats, how many do you have? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't want to put anyone on the spot. Yeah. I got a decent guess at it. I think it's that's about that's eight. Six, six, or eight. Or eight. six to eight yeah. is the number six I have in my mind as well. Yeah, and then Kino is placed. I'm, I'm getting caught up here. Yeah. Is Kino placed in any? Kino, Kino? Yeah, in tap. And, uh, yeah, yeah, in our tap sports picture. bar. The sports bar. Yeah, okay. Kino in our tap sports bar. Okay. That's, Thank you. That's You're such welcome. a popular game, right? The sports bars. Well, we were asked that exact question recently and didn't have a great answer, so thank you for illuminating it a bit. Uh, but we'll and and, and as you that. mentioned, my, uh, Chair, my recollection also is uh, in the past, I don't know to what degree uh, Plain Ridge does this still, uh, they did a lot of promotions in which they offered um, mm -hmm. um, scratch tickets to their customers. Um, so the main purchaser of the scratch tickets for a period of time was the casino itself, um, which is perhaps something that you alluded to with, uh, with uh, promotions. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're a large customer. We continue mm -hmm. to experiment with, with right. uh, the, the tickets as a part of our promotional package. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, on the compliance side, are, are you taking over this, Karen? Sure. Uh, I will transition to uh, Karen McCray, our Director of Compliance. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So for the three, first three months of the quarter, um, we have January, January, February, and March. We saw a little bit of an increase of minors intercepted on the gaming floor. We had taken, we had taken the X out of the gaming floor in early fall. So we knew that we would see an increase of minors being taken off of the gaming floor. But our security has done very well. Um, with intercepting the minors. We had, as you can see, we've had a small percentage of minors gaming on the gaming floor and very few of them drinking on the gaming floor um, in comparison to how many member or how many guests that we've had in the casino. Is there a particular part of the floor that's more prevalent than others for this? You know, it's mostly just right off of the gaming floor that we're seeing that and we're having our security as we go on I'll explain but we have we have security trained now and we have posts that they're at um, secured posts that they're at to actually intercept and escort folks off of the gaming floor now so uh, we're learning as we go if I could just add the um, the the numbers you know Seeing 102 and 133 intercepted in the gaming area, you know, initially causes, gives you some pause, but, but we suggest that that's a really good thing. As we've ramped up our efforts and really focused on training and aggressively pursuing this work, th that represents catching minors who, due to our design, haven't been able to get on. We find them quickly, and we even look at the, the time, we go through reports and look at the intercept times um, and see how long they've been on the floor before we've caught them, and that's been um, decreasing um, as every month that goes by, we're getting better and better at it, and those times are really um, condensing. So um, we really view this as the more we can intercept and get off before they're able to gain, um, that that's a really um, 
strong statistics. How, um, how are you calculating the intercept time? Is that in partnership with surveillance? I mean, you're going back and look at the camera and see how long the child. The literally, each one of these incidents has, has been a, yeah, has a surveillance report uh, and goes through and tracks them back from the time they entered, where they came from, how long they were there, and, and so um, these reports are based on a stack of, of documents that focuses on each individual individual incident, and through surveillance, you're able to see exactly the amount of time where they came in, where they were, um, and so that's how we know that. Uh, that's how we know the times. Those um, surveillance. Um, um, the activities that are detected on surveillance probably are a good tool for security as well because they see where they missed it on the front end. They see where somebody was able to get on underage um, and maybe that will require a change in, in security. I know you have, us, uh, you have an update here so I don't want to jump. It looks like there are many changes that are being made. Yeah, um, just one, one more point and I'll pass it back to Karen um, in response. To your question, Commissioner O'Brien, and uh, on that point, we use the data. Uh, Jason Rucker has done somewhat of a mapping exercise, and so looking at those surveillance reports, plotting out where the individual was, um, and looking at whether there are any real hotspots. Mm -hmm. The short answer is that it's pretty spread. There aren't. We haven't been able to identify um, any areas where there's a real problem. It's uh, because of the nature of the floor. People can really sneak on at any spot, and you do see it spread throughout. But we do that exercise to see if there are any vulnerable areas um, by looking where they got them. Great. I, I was just going to add, I, this, is, um, this is a real focus for the, for the company. Uh, there are tremendous resources that are being applied here. Uh, if we could do it again, we might not have come up with the great porous design that makes that facility so special because in retrospect, the amount of surveillance time that Seth just described, we take every incident and backtrack through the series of cameras um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm constantly reminded by our surveillance folks how, how, um, how draining the exercise is for each incident. Mm -hmm. uh, our, our security officers, I just did an, uh, a round table with our security officers, and one of the Q&A comments that was made by one of, one, of, one of the really great security officers that's been there since the beginning was anxiety over the enforcement of um, underage gaming. Mr. Mathis, I'm always worried that, you know, if someone sneaks on while I'm dealing with a customer, you know, what the discipline will be like, and, and, and it's real anxiety by our staff. Uh, that tells me two things. One is they understand the priority it is for us, um, and secondly, that we need to um, assure them that, you know, this commission and, um, in, and your staff has been really um, supportive of, of sort of the balance. Uh, to the extent that there is a heat map exercise, and I've seen it, I think the, the incidents are largely around the perimeter, mm -hmm. and that's because every IOA is a doorway into the casino. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly uh, proud of the effort that Seth mentioned is when I see uh, four minutes, three minutes, six minutes in terms of the, when using the surveillance, the time from when the person got onto the floor and, and to the time that our security officers were able to intercept them, question them, and get them off. I mean, that's pretty tremendous for a 125,000 square foot floor with 2,500 machines. So our goal is, is, is zero tolerance, but, uh, but be assured there's a, there's a significant amount of resources and efforts going towards um, getting, getting us to even these numbers, given the amount of visitation we have. And on, on that note, um, Mike, is there, um, do, you, do you see this ongoing in terms of that effort, or uh, is there at least uh, potentially the, um, uh, the effect of educating the community effectively through all these um, interceptions um, as a way to deter, you know, in the longer term, uh, some of the minors um, trying to get in? Um, yeah, I, I believe the trend, I, I believe we're going to start continue to trend down. Um, I'm glad you raised it. I think, you know, one of the things that's really sort of disconcerting to me is when I look at some of the incidents is the number of parents that are bringing their underage children onto the floor. To, to accompany them. Mm -hmm. And I think collectively we have to talk about what we're going to do in terms of penal penalizing folks. And, and there needs to be a serious repercussion for sneaking on the floor. Um, I don't know. I think that right now there's a $1,000 fine through the gaming statute. But um, 
I know in other jurisdictions that you could potentially lose your driver's license or you know, real ramifications so that the word gets out. It's no different than what we do in terms of um, some of the criminal elements that your, your um, GU unit and Springfield police you know, make it very clear this is not a place you wanna be if you're, you're trying to conduct criminal activity. And similarly, this is not a place you want to be if you're found underage gaming. But I think there's an enforcement piece that, that we're not able to employ that we maybe uh, could use your support on with the AG's office, et cetera. Are you referring any of those to GEU in terms of if you've got proof through the surveillance look back that a parent was the one that pulled a minor onto the floor? Uh, I, I, it out? Yeah, I just saw one uh, the other day. GU is involved in all of them, um, and they see the case file. I think one of the parents just got a summons. So I, I, I think we've had that conversation, and I think we're starting to see some more enforced, um, enhanced enf enforcement. But I don't think that was always the case, and I think we got to continue to do more of it. Are we examples of this? Are we talking about a parent that brings an 18 or 19 year old? That's right. Yeah, not uh, not as much the. Uh, although we have seen situations where someone's put a five year old on their lap and and for some reason thought it was a good, good idea to let them hit the number, which is outrageous. But but more the 18, 19 year old that looks you know that looks like an adult and, and obviously if accompanied by a parent, you assume yes. um, our our staff is more assuming that they would be um, they'd be of age, but we still do the checks anyway. And, and we did have a very constructive meeting, or yeah, constructive meeting with um, GU uh, and Brian Connors and his team a few weeks back because we had one incident where we had a, a parent who had been previously trespassed and assisted with a minor getting on the floor. And, and so our, um, our message was we really have to work with, with you and the Attorney General's office to um, have some teeth because if it's just mm -hmm. get off the floor and leave and then they come back and do it again and it's get off the floor and leave and they come back and do it again there's it, right. the only thing we can do is get them off and, and trespass right. them but we need uh, we need some some help and and uh, GU and and the team from the Attorney General's office recognized that was very collaborative and I think um, you're gonna see more summonses being issued for minor offenses uh, hopefully moving Great. forward thank you for that thank you Maybe you were going to get into into these uh, later, but um, um, how is the break between finding somebody gaming at a slot machine versus a table game? Um, it occurs to me that you know clearly if you're interact if you're clo interacting with a with a person, um, that that may be uh, that, that should be a different story. If you walk up to a yeah. machine you have more chances of being unnoticed, at least for some time. Yeah, I, I don't have the breakdown, but it's it's high ratio of, sl of slot infractions to table games. Uh, to your point, uh, any infraction at a table game is totally unacceptable to us. Uh, we've had, there's always some mitigating of circumstances. So, somebody thought someone else checked them. There was a shift change. Um, they're not excuses, they're explanations, and we're using those learnings to figure out how to make sure that we cure some of those gaps. But the, the large majority of the incidents that are, are set forth below are slot machine incidents. Um, to me, the more egregious ones are the, the few table games ones because there was a human interaction and there was a breakdown on either training or our process. Is, it, is, there, is, it, is it safe to assume that the majority of these incidents are happening on the weekends? Those are your busiest times? Uh, no, unfortunately, the there's, it's not that consistent a pattern. Um, we've seen them, um, they tend to be in the evening. Um, that's right. some commonality there. Uh, but, uh, but they're largely you know, related to visitation. So more of them happen on the weekends because we have more visitation, but they're not, disp in my mind, because we looked for some of those patterns. They're not disproportionate, proportionately weekend right. fractions. Is it, and is it possible to, you know, how does it line up with your schedule of events when you're doing a lot more activities on the plaza? Does, does that kind of tip the numbers? You yeah, you, you may recall we had, a, we had a big problem in November. Uh, it was all around our tree lighting and mm -hmm. ice skating activity, direct yeah. correlation. So um, that was more maybe access violations versus gaming act, uh, violations. So, you know, I think some of the things that I've talked to security about is, is when events break out of the plaza, those doors are your first entree into the casino is to have a presence there so that we can push them and, and remind them they've got to go left and right on the, um, on the tile versus right. into the carpeted gaming area. Right. Uh, but there's no question, and I think the way Seth was really a champion of this percentage concept because I think it, 
um, should not just look at the gross numbers, but really look at it as a percentage of visitation. We expect a lot more visitation um, over the summer months. Um, there may be more incidents, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the percentage will go down and we'll continue to be, be aware of that, um, especially around family programming days. Okay, I'll give it back to Karen. So the next slide, it just goes over some of the security plan updates, some of the security plan updates that we've gone through in the last quarter. We've provided extra additional um, underage signage. We've also eliminated some of the, cross, the crossing route on the floor, um, the physical presence to check the minors at peak times. That's been, that's been crucial to keeping some of the minors off of the floor. Um, permanent rovers, that was a um, suggestion of some of the gaming agents, um, and that's actually been um, one, of the, one of the ideas that we have implemented into our security plan. And Karen, if I could just jump in sure. on that to elaborate uh, um, what permanent rovers means. Um, there, we have rover posts, security rover posts, um, that are assigned to the floor to rove in attentive various matters, including um, checking for minors. Um, because of the nature of their roving duties, they would from time to time be pulled for other, um, whether there's an emergency call uh, for the drop, and some feedback from the gaming agents was they were just being pulled too much for other duties, and we needed to ensure that dip, uh, on various shifts, certain uh, certain of the rovers' minimum staffing that they would we would commit not to pulling those rovers for other responsibilities, so that they were always there roving the floor. And so we went back and forth with with uh, Bruce and Burke and arrived at uh, numbers based on dem peak demand times that uh, are now built into the security plan that we have committed not to pulling those rovers. Mm -hmm. um, for other duties. Um, mm -hmm. right. We have our hand stamp program that the security officers carry around a hand stamp. They ID, once they ID someone, they can stamp them. That gives the um, employees where they can just look at their hand and see that they've been ID'd, but that doesn't preclude them from IDing them again if they want to. So an employee always has the ability to hand stamp or to ID anyone, even if they have a hand stamp. Can Is it for the minor too, or just if you're for, over for a minor? So there's different stamps depending. Well, it's just it's a hand stamp. If someone is over 21, we'll hand stamp them if we've ID'd them. But if they're under, they get nothing. They get nothing. So they they need to be escorted. Again. Yeah. Have you considered implementing a stamp for all of your guests or some other bracelet um, program to really address this in a physical fashion? Yeah, we. I mean, we've we've really debated all types of programs, including a bracelet. Uh, I think the challenge with the numbers we have, ten to fifteen thousand per day, it's just um, one managing that, and two, just really with the customer experiences. You know, even some of the customers we get now don't appreciate being stamped and having ink on their hands. And if you really, if you think about the customer experience, that um, I don't think there's any facility. Um, in the industry that that does anything like that uh, with the crowds and the queues it, it just be it, it we think it'd be unmanageable so uh, but we're open to any any ideas uh, so the way it works is if you see when you say a frequently id'd patron somebody who hovers around a, a youthful look finally to avoid getting uh, asked again do they seek out the stamp or how, how does that get determined we're going to stamp you I, I can tell you some of our regulars that are, you know, there's, there's probably no worse place than MGM Springfield if you're a baby-faced 40-year-old uh, <laughs> because you will be stopped by everybody in the building. Uh, so our, 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 our frequent customers go right to the podium and get a stamp because they know um, that they're going to be stopped. Um, nice. Others will, um, will either stop them, right? Uh, if you can go back one, Karen. Yep. Self-identify yourself. Mm -hmm. So one, one great sort of, uh, call it innovation that we've made to deal with this is this podium, which is at our main corner. We get about 90% of our traffic off the self-park garage. Mm -hmm. So that's really a high, high impact area. Uh, this podium um, feels like a checkpoint. It doesn't have sort of the, the barriers of a checkpoint, 
but that's been really successful. So a lot of our regulars are checking in at that podium getting stamped. We stop a lot of our folks that are underage at that podium, um, ask them for the ID and give them the opportunity to get stamped. But of course others can, can come in through other entrances. So uh, the idea is, is uh, if, you're, if you're stopped, we always give you the choice to be stamped. Either we'll stamp you there or we'll let them know if you'd like, you can go to one of our security officers and get stamped. I think sometimes they pass on that offer until they're stopped the third or fourth time and they say, I better get a stamp, or otherwise this is gonna be, um, you know, it's gonna be a long night. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we, and we warn them of that. I, every time I approach a customer, I said, I know you've probably been stopped before, it, just to warn you, you'll probably be stopped again. We're, we're very uh, conscious of anyone that looks under 30, 35 to, to really be active um, about checking IDs. So we talked about education into the community. This, the education into the community will come through word of mouth. We will, um, in, uh, as customers are already already seeing that they're gonna come to MGM Springfield and they're going, they're going to be ID'd now. We're seeing that happen. They're coming right up to the podium and asking for a hand stamp because they know that as soon as they come in, they're gonna be ID'd. So that's already happening. Employees are attending underage training classes. It was a mandatory class for several of our um, sections within the gaming um, establishment. All of our table games employees, all of the um, food and beverage employees attended an under 21 class. How to, how to establish and how to ask for IDs. It was put on by Peter Fox, who we talked about earlier. It was an excellent class. In addition to that, um, before shift, um, they're reminded of um, that they need to be vigilant with the um, looking for minors and also not just um, looking for minors, but how to ID and IDing. So that's their pre-shift for all of the security as well as um, table games employees. Also, we have a property curfew. It comes at midnight and it goes until 8 a.m. All of the doors um, on the perimeter are locked with the exception of two for coming into the building. They can all, be, they can all exit the building, but they can't come into the building. And then, um, yeah, that's the next slide. And you can see there's a slide that shows all of the locked doors, unless they're a hotel guest. If they're a minor and they're a hotel guest, they can stay. So a hotel guest um, can go through one of the floors, I'm sorry, one of the doors that is closed with their key? They, they, there are they key can't go through swipe? the door still, but they, they can be in the gaming establishment, but they can't go on the gaming floor. Oh, that's a curfew, okay. Yeah. I've, uh, okay. <laughs> does, that, does that curfew cause any problems with movie times getting out? You know, movie gets out after midnight and I've taken my kids. You know, it's really an entry curfew, so uh, there's no movie that starts after 10.30 at night, I think we checked, so it's people exiting the late movies are fine, but no one, um, it, we're finding, this is a very successful program. There's no really, there's no reason in our minds for any minors to be on the property after midnight unless you're a hotel guest, okay. to be entering the property after midnight unless you're a hotel guest. Mm -hmm. It's the entry that you're And the exit of the movies is gonna be right there by that podium, so they're gonna be, have to go right, right there and out, right. so. So at those times, uh, at night, um, it's um, the, the security check uh, that, that, that appears in the picture, that everybody has to be uh, um, ID'd Correct. to go through? Yeah, for entry. Correct. Yeah, and, and it's a bit of frustration to some of our older customers. Why do I have to stand in line to get ID'd? But we explain the program and you know they're generally supportive, mm -hmm. so. Some of the additional measures to prevent minors from accessing the gaming and the alcohol um, are, are said here, but I just wanted to go over a few additional ones. Our um, food and beverage section is also putting together a, an additional <coughs> training for their employees that will go over this, um, the over 20, or IDing and um, looking for over service. Again, 
they're going to be going through all of their employees and anyone else in the a gaming establishment that would, li that would like to take that class. Um, they also, before every shift, talk about over service. It's, it's, it's their main concern as well as IDing right now. Um, we've also put together a committee um, at MGM Springfield that meets once a week that goes over all of the um, all of the under 21 um, folks that we found on the gaming floor and we go over the reports that we have from surveillance and we look at those on a weekly basis now to see where they're coming in, how long they were on the gaming floor, what um, what we can do to make that a better a better situation for our casino and for the guests because we don't want them there any more than than you want them there. We want we want it to be a safe environment for for all of us and having them on the floor, especially um, having interactions with them, is not what we're looking for. Um, I think that. And you'll Karen, if I could jump ahead. in, yes, uh, you'll do. see a photo here that um, this is uh, Julio Torres, one of our security officers, and um, we recently recognized him. You'll see the photo with Mike and Jason Rucker, our executive director of security. Um, he's he's kind of our our minor assassin. Um, we, we went <laughs> we went through. Uh, the, Seth, I don't know if that's a great <laughs> out of context. That's. Um, fine. So um, we went through and looked at. Um, looked at the reports and how many uh, minors um, we've intercepted and who is responsible. And Mr. Torres um, uh, found 32 uh, minors over the three months we looked at uh, and uh, found one gaming. And so that was by far uh, more than any other security officer. So we wanted to reinforce that with him, uh, reward him for his, um, his good attention to this issue. But he escorted all of those minors off the floor, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah. there were 32 that he escorted off yeah. the floor and one was gaming. Well, this will become a competition, maybe? Hopefully. Yes, that's what we're looking for. <laughs> you know, to that point, in addition to sort of the stick of discipline, we are looking at incentive programs. Um, and even this is just sort of a soft recognition so that yes. the word is out that this is meaningful to us. And um, you will land on our radar if you, uh, as an employee, are really um, achieving in this area. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to lose Julio as a security officer. He is getting promoted to be a dealer uh, oh. Oh. in the coming months. So at least we'll get a little bit better, uh, um, a little bit better performance on the table game side. And um, but he's a, he's a great employee, and, and um, it's great that he's he's um, he's growing in the company. Terrific, and he'll be uh, effective in that role, possibly right. as a That's dealer. right. Yeah, I think he could the bring it. That's right. He could bring a new culture to the table game group. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, to that end, at the prior point about you know meeting with 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 other uh, stakeholders, um, are there um, uh, other things that you're learning uh, relative to you know how to better implement uh, these programs or modify them uh, going going forward? I, I think I touched on one of them, which is just to really, one, reinforce training, one, culturally, make sure that people understand that um, that finding minors on the floor is something that um, is going to be celebrated and rewarded to change the culture. And then, um, and then really just to shore up some of our procedural gaps. I think some of the shift changes and people assuming others have checked a minor is something I've seen as a constant theme. Uh, the balance is you risk harassing a, a customer, um, but I think if you do it right, and I've, I've tried to model that, there's a way to do it nicely, and in fact, I'd, I'd love to get carded. It's been a long time since I have. So there's a way to, to do it in a customer service complimentary way and, and give them the tools to make sure that they get a stamp and, and we're able to you know stop, stop them from being um, intercepted. So some of those things we're doing culturally and, and procedurally. I have two additional comments. Um, one is that in the, in the training class that Peter Fox put together, he did a very nice job of showing our employees how to do, how to ID employees in a very professional, nice way to where it doesn't interrupt their play so much that, it, that, it's, a, that it's something that we have to do. Um, so that was, it was a really, it was a really, I sat in on a couple of his trainings and the way he, trained our employees was excellent. And the other thing was that our, our, super, our security is also going to be getting 
um, some infrastructure, some Veridox machines and some podiums so that they'll be able to take the license and scan it and see right away that their impl or the customers or the guests are 21. So that's something else that will help them as well. So they won't have to be standing there. They'll be able to scan the ID and, and there won't be as many, um, as much time spent with the guest interrupting their play. So. Oh, so, so you're, you're putting a, uh, a machine that you can just Yes, have it's a, in the, the works. Mm -hmm. what, what is that called again? Veridox. Veridox. Mm -hmm. Is it handheld or is it No, it'll be, po it'll be at the podium. Sorry, mm -hmm. excuse me, Commissioner. You don't know, it's, it's, it, it will be at the podiums, the yes. ones that, okay. So, but you, you don't have that uh, now? We do have Veridox. They actually have to take them take him to different places within the casino, uh -huh. but this will be security. The security will have them. Right. So then the, the, uh, whoever gets carded, uh, whoever's doing the, the, the review, they don't need to do the math in yeah. their minds, you know. Both today minus 21. Yeah. Well, and they're effective at, at false IDs. Yeah. It's yeah. more than just right. reading the age. They're okay. a very effective tool to um, okay. looking at all kinds of IDs to make sure they're legitimate. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, mm. I, I just always wondered, you know, when I get carded at, at Fenway Park, if they're really doing the math or, or they're just looking at <laughs> uh, 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 I still, I do, Every, everybody gets, uh, gets uh, <laughs> uh, Commissioner, you realize they card everyone, right? <laughs> yes, they, they card everybody. And I always find it, frankly, I don't know if they're looking really, but um, yeah. anyway, I just have to throw that in there. You would be unmolested on our floor. <laughs> <laughs> it's comforting to me. <laughs> okay, anything further for Karen? No. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Geary. I'm the director of finance, so I have oversight over our procurement team. Um, so I'll be giving the update today um, on our procurement spend as it relates to our, our commitments. So as you can see from this first slide, uh, which represents our diversity spend, uh, we continue to make strides to both uh, meet and exceed our commitments. Um, Overall spend quarter over quarter uh, was slightly down, which can be attributed to uh, what Mike, Mike mentioned earlier. Uh, we have pretty soft first couple months of the year, uh, which is in line with the seasonality of the business. Um, so as the business contracted slightly, um, we controlled our expenses a little bit better. Um, overall, there was $10.3 million in identified biddable spend, um, which was comprised of uh, or which included $1.7 million <clears throat> to diversity suppliers. So that percentage of 16.2% or percent, uh, of payments to diversity suppliers is actually a slight uptick quarter over quarter. Um, we were right around 15% in Q4. Um, speaking specifically uh, about women-owned businesses, uh, you can see we, we improved quarter over quarter, uh, still moving towards that 15% goal and uh, we remain uh, pretty flat in terms of the minority-owned business spend, uh, and we, we are doing a lot of work around that um, to improve it. So one of the things uh, to just touch on that for a minute is we are continuing to sponsor um, the GNE MSDC. Um, we are continuing to engage them, going to matchmaking events. I'll speak a little bit later um, about some of our outreach that we're doing. Um, but they are also going to be, we're going to be hosting them for their annual meeting uh, this September at MGM Springfield. <clears throat> um, in terms of veteran-owned business, which is one of the highlights, uh, we continue to exceed. Um, and we talked about these goals being a floor, not a ceiling, I think, uh, last time. So um, that continues to remain true in terms of uh, veteran-owned business spend. Uh, we are always looking to continue to, to raise the ceiling on that. Um, one intriguing note in terms of diversity spend I, I want to mention today is we do have in Q1 um, a quarter million dollars of spend with a diversity supplier uh, that is not registered. So we're unable to count that. So um, we are working very closely with the supplier and with the CWE to get that 
that registration expedited um, so we can we can count that moving forward so um, we do anticipate to see the the percentage for woman owned spend uh, to continue to increase uh, Brian can you uh, just touch on the historical uh, how is, has, is this trend uh, you, you, you're comparing two quarters the last two quarters here uh, remind us what was um, in general the history of the operation side I remember your construction side being very successful. Right. Um, I'm thinking particularly of this category only. Right, so um, construction, uh, in terms of operating supplies, we had a, a very large capital budget, uh, which we were able to um, lay the foundation for operations uh, in terms of our supply base. Um, so we are still, you know, seeing the benefits of that. Um, however, our, our spend is significantly um, less in terms of operating, uh, if you were to compare it to that, that capital budget. So um, in Q4, I think um, there, was, there was still a little bit of um, spend towards stabilization and, and some of that equipment that maybe we had missed, um, where in Q1, kind of everybody had, had their feet under them. And, and then we were, we were looking you know, at, the, at the seasonality of the business. And as, like I said, as the business contracted, we also controlled our expenses a little bit better. So um, I think that you know, that's the impact in terms of the overall spend quarter over quarter. Um, but as you can see, the percentages uh, continue to, to increase in terms of women-owned and, and veteran. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I know you continue to work with, with Jill and Crystal, and I think you touched on something that as we get closer to finishing up some regulations I think we have on business certification that we need to get the word out like you're doing with that one example of saying, you know, it, you may think I'm a woman-owned business or a veteran-owned business, but until the certification comes across, right. you can't count them and we can't count them. So I think we should think about a role we can play to get that message out when the regulations are finalized to say, these are the certifications that we accept. If you're not certified with one of these agencies yet, please do so because it helps you and it helps them. Correct. Um, and then the other thing the team continues to do is we do um, monthly uh, analyze our non-diverse spend and see where there might be opportunities to, um, you know, either put something out to bid or, or in this case, convert something that, that may already be diversity spend but not have the registration. Right. Our next slide represents our, um, our local spend. So local spend actually overall in the Commonwealth um, went up from 10.7 to 11.5 uh, quarter over quarter, uh, which represents uh, just under 60% of our overall spend. And 5.9 million of those, uh, of those payments were actually in Western Mass in the four counties um, included in our host community agreement. Uh, so I think that's a great story. Um, Western Mass remained, in terms of a percentage, remained relatively flat. Um, but we continue to, uh, again, continue to work with, um, with our local certification partners, with um, our vendor advisory task force, with Jill's team. Um, as well as internally, we're doing, you know, we do quarterly trainings now. So um, we really raise awareness around the property with our operators. And, and um, I can tell you that our entire ops team takes ownership of these goals and they utilize my team, my procurement team, as kind of the gatekeepers for decision making, which is a necessity um, in order to keep this progress going. Um, they come to us first and, and allow us to analyze the supply base, analyze the opportunity, and take into account anything that needs to be done from a cost perspective um, to, uh, to drive these numbers. Ryan, are the, these numbers I assume reflect not uh, biddable spend? Um, these, this is a, this is all overall spend. Overall spend. Yep. Okay. The only thing excluded from these numbers is any um, any taxes or government payments. Mm -hmm. So this is everything, including diversity spend, including biddable spend. All right. Is it is it safe to say? And you know, Mike alluded to it earlier. You changed out some games to games which. Really, there are no Massachusetts manufacturers that constitute some of the, what you categorize as non-local spend, is that? 
stuff that you can't find in Massachusetts because of the gaming nature of it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, gaming equipment would be in that number. So right. to your yeah. point, these these percentages would be even more <coughs> impressive if you if you carved out some of those that weren't even available for local and diverse spend. Okay. That would actually be really helpful um, going forward to understand what tr truly is not available. And then to the extent it is available in Massachusetts, it would be interesting and, and helpful to understand why it doesn't make sense for you to use the, the vendors in Massachusetts. Because we understand there will be business considerations, but it would probably be really helpful to understand that landscape. Okay. Yeah, sure. that's something we can do in a future report. Thank you. Yep. And our last slide here just is, represents all the outreach that we did in Q1. Um, I can tell you we've already exceeded um, the number of outreach events that we've done in Q2. Um, we find that um, we've, we're, get, we're having a lot of success, A, partnering with our certification partners and, and Jill's team, but also uh, re-engaging with our, our local chambers um, and going to, to their offices and meeting face-to-face with uh, local diverse suppliers. Um, and I can tell you just in terms of um, some of these meetings that we did, there are, very, there are opportunities in various states of completion with, with local diverse suppliers. Um, so we are, we are seeing success, we're making those connections. And um, you know, we know that it, it's a very important piece of our, of our business and our operation to, uh, to help drive these commitments. So, um, that's something that we're, we're committed to continue to do um, next quarter and beyond. Are you looking at any opportunities in the Worcester County area? I see you've got some Connecticut-based things. but Yes, uh, there was one Connecticut. Um, th that's just the nature of um, the GNE MSDC mm -hmm. um, not having another event here in Mass. Um, but yes, we, we go all over the state. Um, so we go, we go east and, and, and in western Massachusetts. So we've been to events. Um, not specifically in Worcester uh, yet, but we've been, you know, east of Worcester numerous times. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, pleasure to be back. Um, I know that Jason Randall was told in the fork down um, the last meeting, but I have the privilege to speak to you about our employment numbers. Um, on, so on slide 14 of your packet, you'll see um, I want to talk to the uh, host community agreement with our Springfield residents. As you recall, we have a goal of 35%. And currently for Q1 of this year, we are at 39.3%. That's representative of 906 individuals. Women, our goal is 50%, it's 44.3% currently, 1,021 women on property. Minorities, uh, the goal was 50%. Uh, we are currently at 54.6, representative 1,258 individuals and our veteran goal of 2%. Uh, according to the HCA, and as you recall, we've made commitments uh, to really double that when we were during the campaign year. Really proud that that one continues to hold solid at 6.2%, which is representative of 141 individuals. Um, Commission, your next slide will go really specifically into our total numbers. Maybe I should click the button. So thank you, Sarah, for that. Operator error. Um, so I wanted to speak directly to the overall numbers. Uh, you can see the chart is we were able to put the numbers in from a percentages uh, and also raw numbers for Q4 of 2018 and also Q1 of 2019. You can see, as you recall, the numbers from Q4 of 2,522 total property plus um, our vendors and also our campus-wide tenants. So that also includes the Mass Mutual Center where you are sitting, where we have approximately about 192 currently in that area. Um, and now from quarter, the, fr the first quarter of this year, we are at 2,303 individuals, a total of 81 vendors. So that is Regal, um, that is also Kringle, um, on property, and then we have the total count of 2,384 on property. 
Just of note also, I wanted to bring, um, remember the attrition numbers that we had talked about. Um, we had set some very lofty goals, Jason and the team, of trying to keep the attrition rate down. And I remember speaking to you about this in the campaign phase is that we are really going after that industry standard of 30%. Um, we did, uh, all of last year of 2018, we did hit close to 38% um, of attrition. And, you know, what that comes from is um, the hard work people were um, uh, brought up to during that time, you know, the longer hours, understanding the new positions, a 24-7 operation. We had talked at length about that, of really shifting the employment and how it worked from a casino environment. So really, really proud to date we are only at 16%. So I think we are really understanding as management and supervisors throughout the entire property, focusing more on the employee. As you recall, we focus so much on opening that business, driving success, and now um, we're really spending more time uh, training, uh, encouraging, mentoring our middle management. As you know, those are the individuals who are really the hands-on of our front line. So there's many more programs and training that will come out of uh, learning development that we are in charge of in HR. So that will be the focus, as Mike mentioned earlier. So I just wanted to, to pause and, and to see if you had any questions about those numbers. Yeah, um, Mary Kate, um, do you mean, sorry to be um, uh, precise here, but um, do you really mean uh, turnover or uh, when you when you say attrition? It's turnover, it's, sir, it's yes. People who, um, which is endemic to the industry and, and mm -hmm. I, we've heard and, uh, and understand those numbers in other areas as well. People right, and it's, sir, it's, it's, it's two buckets. It's the uh, involuntary, those who leave for additional opportunities with Encore coming on, there's a large... Uh, group of people who are transitioning, going to other jobs, and then I've got a bucket that's involuntary. Um, unfortunately, that's job performance, um, job abandonment, uh, um, really attendance, not showing up to work. Uh, we have a very robust um, policy that an individual is allowed to have basically 14 days to call out. Unfortunately, we've run into some situations. Um, some of our employees are um, using that, unfortunately. Uh, so there's that both buckets, that involuntary and voluntary. Mm -hmm. And that is attrition, people leaving. We have about 110, Jason, I believe, in drug background and licensing right now, waiting to be uh, go through the system. So those numbers, you'll see them jump, uh, given that we are ramping up um, with some of the, pro the programming that's going on in the plaza and then also taking over Mass Mutual. I don't know why yes, that's happening. Uh, My apologies if that's me. That's no. not you. Okay. Okay. I, I just had a question about the two numbers you described. It was 38% and then 16%. Mm -hmm. and I was just trying to understand. Um, I, 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 I understand that the numbers have, um, the attrition has decreased as you better understand and better train and operate offer opportunities, middle management, but is that, so is that now compared to initially? Yes, yeah, so that, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. So 2018 in totality for the 12 okay. months, we had a 38% attrition rate. Right. For the first quarter of 2019, it is only, it's 16% right now, but that is only for the first quarter. Right. Um, so that's the difference of the number. And so we'll keep, continue to track this, and mm -hmm. by the second quarter, we'll, we'll see where we are. Hopefully, the, our intent is to keep that at 16 or to drive it lower. Um, those who leave voluntarily, do we do exit interviews to find out what that's all about? We do from a management and up perspective. Mm -hmm. Front lines, we do not. Okay. Um, but we do have uh, basically a quick inter just a quick conversation, and most um, the resignation letters do state they're going to another a better job, more money, or going to uh, unfortunately a competitor. Okay. You mentioned the background checks. So right now there's about a hundred pending, mm -hmm. and those are for positions that are going to be subject to our, our licensing process. Some, some will, ma'am, and some won't. Uh, predominantly, the 110 it will be food and beverage, and depending if they're not on the floor, those positions are exempt. exempt. So, so that will turn very you, quickly. For the, those who are exempt, do you still do some kind of your own background check? Of course, okay. yes. Um, so and, then, and then for the positions that are more provisional, in other words, 
you allow them to work pending a completion of the entire licensing process, do you always do some kind of a, a background check initially as well? So um, I'll break that down. So Thank yes, you. we do. We do a drug and background check on every employee um, coming through, and it's a, through a third-party vendor, Higher Right. So what we do, and it's a urine test right now from it for the drug test. We send them out to an area drug testing company, who will then submit that information to Higher Right. At the same time, a background uh, is launched. They put in all of their information, social security, and then that goes through that process. And then in addition to that, if the position requires a license, a license, then we launch the licensing program through the LMS, mm -hmm. and that is all happening at the, same time. at the same time. And to answer your question right now, because we are um, really trying to ramp up, as long as the drug test and the background has been submitted, we are hiring and putting people and bringing them in contingent mm -hmm. on the results of that, very similar to what we did in pre-opening just because of this phase. We typically don't do that unless we need to get additional people on the, the payroll quickly. We will not do that from a licensing perspective. As you know, it is required to have a service or up, some type of license, so they will not start until that is approved by the, the commission. And so for the background check, in, with respect to folks who may not live in Massachusetts, do you also run Cori checks on them as well? We do. We are running the iCori. So if someone is a resident um, in pre-opening, we are running the iCori on everyone coming through because we didn't want to miss anyone. Mm -hmm. Now we are pulling back a little bit and only doing that for mass residents because um, it is only that iCori is only run for that Commonwealth. We, we are running that also. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mary Kay, how many... Uh, you have over 100 currently going through background check. How many postings? You have about 40 some odd postings for jobs currently. The last time I checked, which was yesterday, we had 59 postings, okay. and then that accounts for additional headcount in those postings. Okay, and some of those stay up because of turnover just to that's Keep right. We, we call so. them um, evergreen, uh, evergreen, so we have an opportunity when we know that we're losing headcount based on the job or the hours, we keep these ones open so that we can constantly have a turn of the pipeline um, and just to keep our, our managers ready and get people getting through the system quickly. Okay. You're, you mentioned losing some folks to, you know, our, our Region A licensee. Where are you losing people? What level of position? Um, it's managers, um, supervisors. Uh, we will start to lose dealers soon um, because it's an easier, um, unfortunate win because they already have a license, right? So we'll start to, to see those numbers in the upcoming weeks. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I know employment numbers are always a, a little bit of a snapshot in time, especially in this kind of opening period, but um, I think it would be interesting to um, start to quantify promotions that you're, mm -hmm. that you're doing. I think, you know, we've always talked about this industry having a great mm -hmm. pathway forward for a person starting out at the entry level and, you know, mm -hmm. seeing an opportunity to rise to the ranks. So, you know, tracking promotions, I think, would be uh, an, an interesting data point for us. Yeah, and we, we do that, sir. We just didn't, um, I'll make sure it's included in the next quarterly report. It's something that we are very proud of. And it's something that we have a operational weekly meeting with many of the leaders. And that's something that Jason Randall does talk about um, when we do the, the people update. So it is something that we'll make sure we include in the next report for you. I believe we, we talked about that at a prior meeting, and your numbers were very strong at all levels, correct? They are. Yeah. They are. And I want to, you know, showcase some of those using special. Using that to talk to other licensees about how MGM is able mm -hmm. to do this. Right. So. And we're really proud of that, too, is that I think a lot of us sitting here um, might have had multiple promotions. I can speak to myself of three. Um, since my time with the company, um, and so we're really trying to instill that work ethic, raising your hand, taking more on, um, and I think the company has um, always rewarded that hard work, and we'll continue to do that within our property here. We don't want to lose others um, to our sister properties, though that is still a promotion and a win. We want to be able to do that um, in Springfield. 
Yeah, Commissioner Stavis, I can just tell you anecdotally, uh, only because it's fresh, I was just, in, I mentioned I was in front of the security officers for a roundtable event yesterday, and I mentioned Julio Torres, our, uh, um, we got to come up with a better nickname than the uh, minor assassin, but uh, he, um, he represented one of 23 security officers, and we advised the group that have either transferred or been promoted, you know, transferred up or been promoted within security. And that's out of a group of about 130, 35. So over 10% of that group, that has been turnover, right. um, but over 10% of that group have transferred out and up uh, or within the department. So, um, and I think that's consistent with, with, all the de with all the departments, those type of, that type of career growth. So we, sh we should promote it and we'll make that part of the next report. Considering you haven't been even open a year yet, that's yeah. encouraging. Do you have the, the number of vendor employees from Q418? Um, we did not retract that, ma'am, by uh, vendor badges, so we didn't do that. I would say it's in that same area or so, um, slightly higher due to them ramping up and overhiring, but I do not have that number. Okay, so and we'll you started collecting that Q1 of this that's year? That's right. Okay. And the last thing I want to bring to your um, attention is um, slide 16, just our recruitment efforts, um, very similar to what Ryan does from a supplier and diversity uh, perspective. The team, Jason Randall and Jennifer Russell, who is our director of talent acquisition, is always out with our education partners, our community-based partners, and of course, Mass Hire for Springfield, continuing to keep the pipeline full with employment. And as you know, the Commonwealth has a uh, unemployment rate now of 3%. It's about 3.7, 3.8% in Springfield. Uh, so to the point earlier of really getting out and uh, really recruiting, especially for the gaming school and for the property, that is going to be our mission and, and spending the time with our individuals to properly and continually train up um, and enhance their training across the, the property. So just a, a few uh, recruitment efforts there um, that I'm happy to, to go into uh, detail. One I do want to bring to your attention is the Grow the Show, the internal workshop in the middle. Uh, Jennifer Russell, I believe a few months ago, we had every operation and operator uh, in one of our ballrooms. And we had the opportunity, I think it was about six or seven hours, where current employees could come and speak to other operators and say what, what they're passionate about, where they see themselves three, six, nine months, um, a year from now. And so we had that opportunity. We had about 150 individuals internally come to speak to us, and the intent is to have that at least twice a year. So we can speak to our own employees, find out what they want, what they're interested in, and then uh, promote as appropriate. Yeah. So that was a very successful event. Are you finding that your current employees are becoming good recruiters for you? They are. I mean, nothing's better, um, right, than our, one of our employees uh, being promoted, mm -hmm. loving their job, and going out and recruiting their family and friends mm -hmm. um, and others. So that has happened across the property, yeah, and right. we're seeing that across the, some of the families. The um, programs that we've talked about earlier today, and we've done this for a couple of years now, all the workforce um, training programs, mm -hmm. the community colleges, the, the, the high school, the, the do you see that really aiding you in filling positions? I mean, is there, it sounds like you're all working together effectively to make sure the programs are, and the individuals are prepared for mm -hmm. the jobs? We, we've found great success for those programs um, that we're really building on those quote unquote soft skills, right? Really preparing people for interviews. And, mm -hmm. and we have, as you know, we hire, um, based on someone's ability for customer service and we're going to train up for aptitude. You come in for, with a great attitude. We've said that before and we continue to do that. Um, but what we continue to focus on and what I'm hearing from uh, culinary is we need to constantly um, get ind individuals in the culinary school with Holyoke Community College get people in and out quickly, um, because that is also a position with the cooks, mm -hmm. sous chefs, mm -hmm. chefs, they tend to move around, so we want to make sure those pipelines remain full, mm -hmm. um, and so we can also staff the area as we start to ramp up with the economic development that is coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to support that as more businesses come into the area. Mm -hmm.
Good morning, Commissioner. Sarah Moore, Vice President of Marketing. I've been promoted eight times since I've been in this company, so I'm a <laughs> great poster child of development opportunities. Uh, so talking about marketing, um, our marketing can calendar continues to be an integral part of how we engage our customers and, and build loyalty. And in Q1, it was really a focus on being flexible and evolving and really diving into the data and uh, changing what we need to change and responding to what the customers want. We introduced a lot of different promotions, new promotions. Um, some worked, some didn't. And so we really were, were evolving every day and you'll see that even more in our next quarter report out. We like to say things like today is the, fir the first fourth Friday, uh, Thursday in May. So every day is new day. We're still in uncharted territory. So we really focus on listening to the customers and, and religiously reviewing all of our data so that we can continue to provide those engaging uh, promotions and special events that will bring people back to property. We also have a continued focus on activating the property, um, specifically our armory, our outdoor plaza. Uh, even through those cold winter months, we did some really fun, incredible things. Talia, our um, executive director of entertainment, will go into that a bit more. But our ice rink programming, bringing in um, private entertainment opportunities for our most loyal of customers, activating around our holidays, um, and Chinese, our first Chinese New Year was a huge success as well. And then also um, engaging the community, um, both locally and regionally, from both um, a you know community engagement, but also a B2B standpoint. So some examples here is um, we were one of the bigger sponsors of the Holyoke Parade. We understand this is a cultural and um, important part of the community here around uh, St. Patrick's Day, and it was something we wanted to get involved with to show our commitment to the community. Um, we also staged an event with one Berkshire, uh, to meet the important business members and the business community of the Berkshires. This is, we see this as a great opportunity for us to connect with them, both from a customer standpoint, from a business standpoint, um, and just, just networking. So we had a great um, meet and greet event with them as well, which has led to some further conversations about various things we can do with that community. And then finally, one of our bigger announcements in um, Q1 was our Boston Red Sox sponsorship. Um, as a, as a pure fan, this was pretty pretty big highlight for me, but um, we're really, really excited about what this does for our business, not only from a positioning us in the sports and entertainment space, but also our ability to really um, engage the community of Boston, close that gap between Eastern and Western Mass that we always say is there, and then also provide really incredible opportunities for our high value customers. Uh, we had a group out there yesterday playing softball, softball on uh, the Fenway Field. These are really spectacular opportunities that um, these types of partnerships afford us for our customers. So other than, of course, the, the signage, the, the whole branding, you, you actually engage your customers with, mm -hmm. with the Red Sox and yes. opportunities to go to games or events. Exactly. There's a big part of it. Everyone, you know, the perception is it's just we're on the green monster, but there's so much more that comes along with that in terms of hospitality opportunities for our customers, um, whether it be at games or away games or all, all sorts of different experiences that we can then take back here to our high value customers and afford them those opportunities for being loyal to us here in MGM Springfield. There's also, um, as a part of the partnership, there's various activities that I can't get into too much detail yet, um, more to come, that we'll be bringing to property and that was another important part of the partnership it's not just about what can we do in the city of boston but what can we do to activate the property here and bring those people west great thank you uh, so i think sarah properly warned me not to get into something i was about to get into so well done sarah <laughs> but um but one of the other great opportunities because i was at the event yesterday with our customers you know really delivering special experiences that no other competitor can provide um, so being able to play on the field, um, it was one of them. But what was really unique about it is it's not just Boston fans that appreciate those opportunities. We had a diehard Yankee fan, and he said his heart's been broken so many times on that field, he had to step on it. Um, uh, so it's, it is a great opportunity to import um, business. 
um, Detroit Tigers games, we have the MGM Grand Detroit. We are um, bringing business from outside the state into, um, into the Commonwealth. We're hosting those folks as part of a series. So they're even rooting for the, for the opponents. And we do that in a bunch of our other markets as well. So we try to find a, the, the home team for a sister property and create a little bit of a promotional opportunity to bring them into the property and, and have them experience the game with us. Mm -hmm. President Mathis, are you being converted to be a Red Sox fan? <laughs> you know, being in Vegas, I was a bit of a free agent, so you guys, you guys got me. But Jersey roots, you're not the Phillies? Yeah, or? no. Not anymore. You got me. <laughs> okay. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a bandwagon guy. So. <laughs> okay. And, and obviously for us here in Springfield, the most exciting part of this partnership, which was announced, is Winter Weekend. So bringing the huge fan fest, which will bring about 68,000 people from um, all over the region to Springfield next January uh, for a three day long fan fest that will just be incredible for this city from an economic development standpoint, from a really, you know, supporting putting it on the map for in the sports space. Great. So excited about that. Right. And I'll turn it over to Talia. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so just a slight Q1 recap. I think you've seen most of this. Uh, we, we will be continuing with Roar throughout the summer and into the um, winter series. We did renew that agreement um, with our partner promoter on that. And so we've announced um, nine different artists with 30 different shows as of this morning that will go on sale tomorrow. Um, and we'll continue to add more events um, to that series, which has been um, very successful for us. And then um, we had Just Hilarious, we had Lala's, and um, AHL All-Star Weekend, which um, Sarah touched upon, Red Sox Winter Weekend. Um, we like to think of this as sort of our trial to get ready for um, what will only continue to be more citywide sporting events that are across multiple days. So we're excited for that. And then I just wanted to give you sort of a 60-day outlook. Um, we won't go you know, through all of these charts, um, but a couple of highlights, you know, over the next 60 days, we have over 50 events scheduled, um, and that's across all of our venues. So Armory, uh, the Plaza, the Ballroom, Symphony Hall, and the Mass Mutual Center. Um, we've already demonstrated our ability to bring the first um, pro boxing event uh, to the property, which was earlier this month, a partnership with Murphy's Boxing out of Boston. Um, which was a broadcasted event on UFC Fight Card and will later broadcast on CBS Sports Network as well. Um, very good success, and we'll be bringing another event in August with that same promoter, so we're excited about that. Um, we also um, just ramped up our MGM Live concert series, and so we will have 35 concerts over the summer. Some are ticketed, um, some are free, and so some highlights of artists are uh, bands like Collective Soul and Gin Blossoms, which will be here not this coming weekend, but the following. Um, Hanson, uh, we've got Billy Currington, Low Cash, so some great name acts as well as some of our local favorites will highlight the Plaza stage in that series. We're also doing some more community-oriented programming as well. Um, myself and Anthony, our, our VP of Hospitality, have partnered on Food Truck Fridays, which will be throughout the summer. Um, and this was really, you know, showcasing our commitment to some of the smaller and local businesses that are owners of food trucks. And we invite them on to the plaza um, for some lunchtime programming uh, throughout the week. So we're excited about that. We started about three weeks ago, and it's been successful. So do local people who work at businesses here come for the food trucks as well as some of your employees? How does it work? Yeah, that's the goal. <laughs> um, we're sort of in a trial period. We want to offer it for our employees, obviously. but. But the real goal of that for Anthony and I is to just um, gain awareness of that Main Street corridor. Get your, get your feet on the ground and start walking down that corridor coming to us and really just trying to educate the city that how walkable we are and how many different programs we have if you'll just walk that couple of blocks to us. So okay. that was the goal. Uh, I'll just say, you know, all credit to the team on this Fruit Truck Friday endeavor. This, uh, we've done it three Fridays. Um, it's rained every Friday, oh. literally, literally every Friday. It was exactly the window that we were holding the event. It's, uh, but I think we finally have a dry Friday uh, tomorrow, and it's been successful. Two, three hundred people have been coming out, even in the rain. I can't wait when you get a great day like we're about to get, what it's going to look like. So I think that awareness was important. It's showcasing um, local food uh, trucks. We're going to give you an update on Wahlburgers, but we had a Wahlburgers truck out for our inaugural, and the line was a little bit over an hour. Wow. So really, um, really great activation. 
location and, it's, and it showcases what's really best about our property, which is the unique architecture and great outdoor space. I think also a really important part of the story is since we launched the first one, the hundreds of local and regional food trucks that have reached out to us. We, I see it on social media every single day more and more who want to be a part of it. So we're giving a forum to those that might not have um, a lot of exposure and we're incorporating, and Talia's team is doing a great job of incorporating all those local ones and showcasing new ones every week. No, I appreciate the, I like the, the schedule. Um, there's some good local talent, one who I think might have played it a junior high dance I attended years ago, but <laughs> he's, a, he's a good voice. How'd you get village people to play your, your dance? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to touch on is um, the Symphony Hall partnership that we've started. We did start programming um, the venue. As you know, we've got a commitment um, for, for booking shows, which we've met um, already with uh, Air Supply, Terry Fader, and Steve Martin, Martin Short coming to the, the theater. And then in the next two to three weeks, we will actually exceed that commitment with four additional shows that we'll be announcing as well. So we're happy about That's that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's covering this, Seth? Um, you can. Generally, <laughs> generally you, but I'll, okay. I'll, touch, I'll take the, the first piece. Um, which is Residential development, I know we're, we're often here saying, you know, it's moving, it's moving, we don't have a whole lot to report. Um, it, unfortunately, it's a similar report, but um, I was um, invited to a meeting in the mayor's office. Um, Mike, was, Mike wasn't available um, this past Monday where the, the mayor brought all the stakeholders into his office again. He's keeping his foot on the pedal. Uh, one of the purposes of that meeting, and I'm intentionally being a bit circumspect, but was um, to, there's, there's one or two main issues outstanding, which really trying to um, finalize. And the report is that, uh, the report was that one of them is being finalized and updating us on it. So there are, uh, meetings continue to happen. Um, we're, we anticipate based on that meeting, um, uh, another purpose of that meeting was also um, advising other city stakeholders of the status and the progress that was being made. Um, we are hopeful based on what we heard in that meeting that uh, an announcement um, by the city will be forthcoming um, in the very near future. Um, so we're, we're still um, actively participating in the discussions and, and eagerly anticipating um, a finalization of the 31 Elm development. And uh, I'll pass the, the rest to Mike. To yeah. So uh, on the Wahlburgers uh, front, we we had a we had a meeting this week. I just saw emails this morning exchanging um, signature pages on on the lease. So the lease uh, has dragged out a bit, which is unfortunate because we lost a little bit of schedule. But we are we're finalizing the agreement now, and we will be announcing um, design and construction um, kickoff dates. So I think our our goal now is to get this open in, in Q1. More to come on it, but it'll be tremendously impactful. The the Wahlberg family is very supportive of this project. They're very engaged generally, but I think they're going to be particularly engaged because this is their footprint in, in Western Mass. So this is an exciting one to, to sort of complete the campus, um, and, and more to come on that. Great. Yeah. And then, Sarah, why don't you cover the next one? Which is the panels. Do you have the... Who's got the clicker? No, Rose, well, Jason's here. Oh, Jason's going to handle it. Yeah. Sorry. Good morning, Commissioners. Jason morning. Rose, morning. Vice President of Facilities. Um, we are um, actively working to install um, a solar panel canopy on top of our garage. This will, uh, it's basically a 1.3 million megawatt solar canopy, which will provide 1,600 um, megawatt hours. To put that in comparison, that would power about 150 homes for a year. For, um, for how long? One year. One year. Yeah. So we will start that um, the week of the 27th, which was this upcoming week. We anticipate being done for um, Halloween. Will you lose some capacity for parking in that period? Um, this will cover about 78,000 square feet of our top floor of our garage, but we don't anticipate losing any parking. During construction? During construction, we will. We will have to uh, basically mitigate parking on the eighth floor, which is for employees. We'll move them down to the seventh floor during the week. We will um, tie up construction ending on Thursday, allowing them to go back to the eighth floor. So 
over our peak periods, we will not lose parking, but in some of our slower weekdays, we will lose parking. Yeah. Don't anticipate that affecting guest or employees. I'm also happy to announce that um, the casino has been awarded the first lead platinum uh, certificate for a gaming um, resort. Obviously, um, some of the things included in that are the solar panel array we just spoke about. Um, as you were aware, during the construction portion, we did uh, some rainwater harvesting where we uh, basically take all of the rainwater off of the garage, take it into a cistern, and we actually use that water to do all the landscape watering around our site. So all of the green greenery you see around the site is watered from, uh, from what we call brown water or reused water. Um, in addition to that, we also diverted about 95% of um, our constructional and demolition weights during the during construction period uh, from uh, landfills. So, great accomplishment, the first ever, we believe. First ever casino to reach platinum in Absolutely. the United States? In the world. In the world. In the world. Is that right? Yeah. It's a tremendous accomplishment. Congratulations. It's really yeah. tremendous. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. <coughs> great. It's Really tremendous, and, and I'm really wondering how you accomplished it. Um, over the, do you have just a high sure of, um, in terms some of, of your whole we, project management plan? Are you talking about during the construction or overall some of the things just we included? Overall. From the start, was that a goal? And it was a goal. It was to yeah. divert you know, at least, uh, I think the requirement was 90%. We exceeded that by about 5%, getting 90% during construction. Um, obviously, our design included LED lights, getting away from incandescence, things like that. Um, we had low flow faucets installed in the property, shower heads, things of that nature to reduce water waste. Um, we also did a state of the art uh, central utility plant. So most of the equipment in the central utility plant uses less energy than you know most of the other things out there. So it was a um, it was a concerted effort from from the beginning to make sure that we met this goal. MGM Resorts, um, as a company, has committed to all new development being at a minimum gold certified. Gold. So we partner with the le leadership in energy and environmental design from the very beginning as we're in the design phase of our properties, and we work with them to design according to that goal. Um, we were just fortunate enough here that we um, exceeded that goal and were able to achieve platinum, which is pretty yeah, remarkable. And this is, this is how they started with the gold goal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then but it's the terrific news to have this. To the solar yeah, panel, it looks like you awarded LEED uh, the the um, highest level before the solar program, or is that part of it's it? It's part of it. It was included. included. Okay. So they awarded it even though it hadn't been it yet. It was contingent on, on panels. Contingent. Okay. A, that's why we delayed the announcement, because oh. we wanted to make sure that that portion of our program was, was, um, was solid and that we had a plan for the installation. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And Jason or Mike, remind us, uh, was any kind of the reuse of um, the urban renewal piece of the project, was that, does that count in, in, in some of the points for this? And just remind me. Yes, it does. Yeah. So that was another big factor, Chair, in, 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 in achieving this. Thank so. you for catching me up, Jason. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioners. So I, I think that concludes our quarterly update. I'm, the, you're going to show uh, that. Yep. I wasn't sure if we got that on. <laughs> so um, we thought we would wrap up today's presentation with something fun and, and light. We are, uh, as of today, we have launched our new brand campaign for our property. So after the successful launch campaign of This is a First, which was very exciting and emotive, we wanted to reposition ourselves in the market as, you know, your everyday, approachable, fun property, because that's really what we are when you look at us amongst our competitive set. Um, we are a downtown local neighborhood facility, and there's always a reason to come see us. So without further ado. Sounds fun. I was thinking for your sister's half birthday, you and I. And yeah, yeah, let's do it. It's almost Arbor Day. Let's do it. Hey! Oh, 
The neighbor's got a new roof. Let's go to MGM Springfield. <laughs> Yeah, great work, Sarah. It's it's it's, it's really amazing being um, in the create in the room when when our marketing firm and Sarah's team gets together and starts to pitch ideas. So, this idea of make us part of part of a lifestyle where you can eat, drink, and go to entertainment, I think, is an important part of our next sort of uh, step with our customers. So, this will be a fun campaign. We'll do it in print, right, Sarah? All the different aspects yep. of it. All different marketing channels. <laughs> you. You guys mentioned back on your future development update, Armory plans and the F and B coming soon. Yeah, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, in fact, I was um, I didn't realize we hadn't put in some of the other pieces, but I'll, I'll give you a quick update. Um, we've got I think we we presented in a, in a prior uh, quarterly update some of the plans we had internally on new projects. So we've got our Plaza Bar um, as we're opening up um, Talia's MGM Live um, uh, campaign. Um, and program, we've got a bar out there to service it, so I think it opens over the weekend, right? Yeah. Friday will be the first day. Um, and your staff's been great work. Pending your vote uh, in <laughs> 15 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't want to, I called that a little early. Um, but your staff's been great working through the approvals and what um, surveillance, all the things we need to do to make sure that that bar um, meets your requirements that you'll be apparently voting on. And then uh, we've got a, uh, we've got another bar called the, um, basically called the Island Bar that's under construction. Some of you saw it as you walked the floor. Um, and that's really, a, it's, it's activating the, the Mass Mutual corner of the building, which is a little bit of the back side of the building, and we thought it needed some love. So we've got a bar under construction. It's got more uh, video poker tops, which is something the customers have asked for, so that will be part of a new campaign. You said it, we did it when we finally opened that bar to the customers. But what's great about that corner is, is it gives us an opportunity to, to create a lot of energy back there. We're experimenting with electronic, t electronic table games, potentially some stadium games, which is that sort of emceed version of gaming. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, it could be a future home of, of a sports book potentially because it's got great wall space and, and the ability to put up TV screens. So big investment. We're spending millions of dollars even post-opening to improve the property and to, and to address anything we see as a gap in terms of what the customer is looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow. I just want to mention an anecdote, but I think it's illustrative. Um, I spoke with the parents of good friends of my wife and I um, last week who uh, live in Houston, Texas, and uh, they go to Vegas often. And they came to visit the casino here because they have grandchildren uh, in the Boston area. And they gave you great reviews on spe specifically on Chandler's, the steakhouse. And coming from uh, people who really like their steak, they, uh, they said that they went there twice. Uh, after uh, they went there a second time because they liked it so much. That's great. So, I think, um, is Anthony still in the room? Anthony, our Vice President of Food and Beverage, I will appreciate that because... Um, the best review on, uh, that they had to do was with, uh, with the steakhouse. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. we, um, we often hear when there's an issue, not always when there's a good <laughs> experience. There's yeah. So appreciate you passing that on. Great. We appreciate the thorough presentation and the update. Uh, I know the last time you were in Boston getting the update, I did ask about the question you know, uh, concerning uh, the young people on the gaming floor. Let's hope that the trend really um, shifts in the right direction we see in March. Um, I know, speaking with you, that you are have deployed a lot of resources with respect to that effort. And you also shared that your, your folks who have been deployed are taking that very, very seriously, enough that it concerns them with respect to their you know, fulfilling all the expectations that you have. We share that concern, and we appreciate theirs. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. I, I think we'll take a break. Um, does, that, does that work for you yeah. folks? Commissioner Zuniga, I just want to say after Mike said that uh, you wouldn't be guarded and Mary Kate called you sir, you're looking very youthful today. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, white hair betrays me at times. <laughs> we'll, we'll take a break um, and come back. I can't see my watch here. Ten minutes. Um, ten minutes, so that puts us right around noon time. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
So we are reconvening our meeting, our meeting, um, and we are moving on to item number four, Investigations Enforcement Bureau, Director Wells, you want to give compliance an update, please? Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Morning. Just as an update to the commission, uh, pursuant to its authority under Massachusetts General Laws 23K Section 6, the IEB has assessed MGM Springfield with an administrative penalty of $100,000 for violations related to noncompliance with provisions regarding minors and underage persons. I recognize you've already had somewhat of a discussion about that issue with the licensee. MGM has agreed uh, to the penalty and is not appealing the fine to the full commission uh, pursuant to their uh, rights and their due process rights under 23K section 36D. So this is merely informative for the commission that this has in fact taken place. The commission has always emphasized the importance of protecting the most vulnerable and wanted our licensees to do what is necessary to protect minors from underage gambling and alcohol consumption. During the first two months after opening on August 24th, 2019, the IEB has emphasized to MGM Springfield the requirements of preventing persons under the age of 21 from accessing the gaming area and procuring alcohol. On October 24th, the IEB gave MGM Springfield formal notice of 22 incidents involving underage persons in the gaming area since that opening on August 24th of 2019. From November 22nd to December 2 of 2019, the IEB documented an additional eight incidents involving eight underage persons with activity on the gaming floor. Seven incidents involved actual gambling activity, and one incident involved a 20-year-old consuming alcoholic beverages. On December 6th, the Commission sent a letter to MGM Springfield directing the closure of the crosswalk on the gaming floor to underage persons. That change went into effect on December 14th, 2019, as has already been discussed by you the You mean licensee. 18 in all these Oh, pardon, days. 19. You two said 18. Eight. Oh, I did. Oh, pardon me. You mean 18. Me. My disregard. I mean, oh, December of 2018. 18. Pardon me. Yes. The December dates are, and November dates are in 2018, to clarify. Yes. And then... Between December 14th and April 23rd of 2018, the IEB documented an additional 14 incidents involving 19 underage persons on the gaming floor, uh, 13 incidents involved gambling activity, and one incident involved an 18-year-old consuming alcohol. In addition to the civil administrative penalty, the IEB required that MGM Springfield identify in writing all modifications to its security plan previously approved in August of 2018 and submit the IEB to the IEB a plan for improved compliance, addressing at a minimum additional training of security personnel and table games personnel with respect to underage persons and minors. I note that you've been briefed on those matters by the uh, licensee as part of their quarterly report. We did receive documents uh, in, in response to the uh, requirement as part of the administrative penalty yesterday, and we're reviewing those documents as well. MGM Springfield did inform the IEB it acknowledges the accuracy of the, of the incidents itemized in the complaints, and they did agree to the amount of the assessment. Uh, as, st as I stated earlier, by its agreement, MGM Springfield has waived its right to an adjudicatory hearing before this commission, uh, and so the matter is at this point uh, resolved, and we will continue to monitor the important issue of minors uh, on the floor and minors consuming alcohol, and we will proceed as our duties as regulators. So that is my update for the commission. I'm available to answer questions, and I think the licensee is as well, as their remedial measures have already been part of the discussion before the commission. Yeah, I, well, I, I was just going to confirm some of that. So um, the incidents that you described here in the, in the memo uh, took place, is it fair to say, um, prior to some of the measures that we already heard about this morning? I think, and, and I'll defer to the to the licensee as, as, as to their specific timing. My understanding, we've had constant communication with the licensee that this is an issue that the commission has indicated they feel strongly about, the IEB feels strongly about, so they had been Im implementing measures as they um, identified the problem with, that it was occurring on the property, but formalizing all of these measures has certainly been done as a result of the uh, this the complaint and the assessment that was issued by the IEB. But if they have any further comments, I'll defer to their yeah, that, to council. That's right. 
That's right, Karen. Um, s several of them have been an iterative process, so the, the items that you heard about with respect to the curfew, uh, the hand stamping, the elimination of the crosswalks, those have been uh, throughout late 2018 and uh, into early 2019 have been implemented to address the issue. The increased signage around the floor is another example. Um, some of the additional measures that we put into place basically it, as part of the discussions in reaction to the recent um, notice of violation include our weekly committee meetings to review incidents um, and, and address them. Um, we also have the enhanced training that we've rolled out um, uh, and we are working on um, finalizing uh, a enhanced disciplinary process, a heightened uh, disciplinary process for minor related violations. Um, those items are um, in, I'll say, in direct response to the recent uh, discussions around the, the um, uh, penalty uh, and the violations. So oh, was there a portion of these that were fake IDs or is this all a question of whether and when IDs were checked? I'd have to look at, at each individual. My understanding is it's mostly the, uh, the just not checking IDs. You, 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 right. Um, failure, to, failure to ID or um, uh, misreading IDs, hum, human error um, with respect to the ID checking process. Um, I noticed, so we're talking about about 30 incidents, the 22 and then the eight, correct? Um, for this report? Not another 14. I, I thought we had. And then another 14? Yeah. Hold on, let me just let me double so check. I, I think there was a formal notice on October 24th about 22 incidents. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, so that was the formal notice. Right. Now yes. for this uh, complaint, there was additional eight incidents. Right plus another 14 incidents, which is 22. So you could add the 20, so, right. So I would count the, the eight plus the 14. So the note, the, the um, complaint is for the 22 incidents, which are described in the memo. Okay. Now there have been other incidents and there are other issues, but these are 22 okay. that the IEB specifically identified as having, um, components where there's failure on the part of the casino to appropriately act and therefore it was subject to this penalty. Right. Oh, good. And, good. and they received notice of? Of prior those. incidents, yeah. correct. So they were on notice pursuant to the statute of the concern of underage patrons. And then after that, with more incidents, the IEB has the statutory authority to impose a, a monetary penalty. Right. So, um, in the report this morning, we heard of some um, of, the, of the minors that were identified and, I, and, uh, and as a percent of uh, total visitation, mm -hmm. uh, that there's uh, a, a trend that's important to understand. More uh, necessarily does not mean lacking uh, controls. It might actually mean that they're act more actively finding them. Um, finding those minors, uh, but also um, what what is the result of the procedures that they have implemented? Right, right. Um, is it fair to say that some of the, I, the, the uh, incidents that you describe may not necessarily be a subset of those that we heard about this morning? Not just because of timing, but because they were identified properly as we expect them to be identified yeah, I mean, quickly? It, it's a tricky situation with the, with the setup at MGM Springfield. So if you compare that to a casino where they have a choke point where everyone has to come through, say, one entrance, they should be checking IDs at the entrance and nobody should get through. So actually, you know, nobody should be on, no children should be on, you know, and in, under the age of 21 should be on the gaming floor. Now I get it that with this setup, it's much harder to control that. So a situation where someone's at the perimeter of the gaming floor and steps onto the gaming floor and then immediately a security guard asks for ID and gets them off the gaming floor. That's identified as someone on the gaming floor, but I get that the security guard has done his or her job. I mean, that situation so you would not put... some of those are in the numbers that, that yes. MGM has identified. So in fairness to the company, they're also see it. You're also seeing some numbers of people that are coming onto the floor and then properly identified and escorted from the floor. 
it's just a systemic issue with, with all these entrances that you can't, you don't have this one choke point where you can automatically keep everyone off the floor. So it's a challenging situation for both the regulator and the licensee. Right, that, that, that aside, which we all understand, right? Yes. This, that, that, uh, that um, of the porousness of, of the floor. Um, when, in the scenario that you describe, when somebody, as soon as, or almost immediately, or very shortly after stepping foot on the gaming right. area, is identified and either told to leave or escorted out. Right. That circumstance we would not view as a violation. Well, would you? Would well, that be uh, fair? We haven't, we haven't fined for that, I would say. Okay. Right. That's that's my right. question. Right. So we're differentiating between where we see some, uh, as as uh, Seth indicated, like some human error, some some accountability by the licensee, right. where, for example, you know, someone's not only just on the floor, but they're on the floor for 45 minutes and they're playing yes. on, a, on a, a gaming machine. That's not okay. So it's up to the licensee to identify protocols and procedures to keep that from happening. But I get it, someone could just step on the floor and then they catch them and then they, they move them off. That those are not incidents which we have identified as part of the administrative penalty. Okay. And Director Wells, I, um, I note that the majority of these uh, incidents, uh, other than three that I count up, are all with 18 um, to 20 year olds. Right. Now is that, do we, un do we think that that's an issue where because other states, neighboring states, allow uh, gaming at 18, that they are, they were coming early here thinking maybe that was okay or whatever, or is it just, is this constant? Is this continuing even after education, signage? Um, how, I'm just trying to understand the, the substance of the problem. I, I may be able to address that a bit better than uh, Director Wells, um, because we've heard, it's more anecdotal, but yes, we do hear as the excuse. Now, whether it's genuine or not, when we encounter these folks at, oh, I thought it was 18. Um, and, and we do have signage everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> big 21 plus. But there is, we hear it enough that I, I think it is, um, it is an issue. Um, we, in fact, uh, at one point, um, an early violation, we dealt with it. We had a, we had an employee who checked an ID, and they were under 21, and the employee <laughs> thought that it was 18 plus. Um, that surprised us. We dealt with it. Um, but there is, yes, there is a um, getting the word out that um, gaming in Massachusetts is not 18 plus as it is in other, some other jurisdictions is 21 plus is a constant um, uh, communication uh, endeavor and through signage and um, word of mouth and otherwise we're trying to get that out. Um, mm -hmm. And we see it, um, I think it's much different today than it was in September for instance. Mm -hmm. um, more people are, are very aware of the 21 plus age. Two, two, um, two features that we, or maybe a couple of the features that we that heard about this morning, um, the podium at the three areas, the, the three en main entrances from the garage, the hotel lobby, and the, the main street entrance. Um, we also heard about uh, the, the machine, Ver the, what, what's, the, what's the name, the Vera Fox? Veradox. Um, and, um, and, and the curfew in terms of you know operations and and uh, and, and, and limited uh, entrance after a certain time, uh, were those all put into place um, as a result of these ongoing uh, discussions and an early identification of some of the um, uh, issues that you identified at least prior to um, October? Um, is that is that a fair? Uh, I think um, it's a combination. I think the the curfew was uh, as we've had a lot of internal discussions on how we address it. The curfew was um, a strategy that we came up with internally and decided to roll out. Um, the Veridox piece was um, at the strong suggestion of uh, Director Band um, that he uh, he thought that that would um, uh, make sense and, and we agreed. So I think um, a lot of the measures have some have been. It's been a constant dialogue with the with the gaming commission and the IAB, and some measures we've adopted have been at their recommendation. Some have been our own, and some have just been through brainstorming. I knew early on we had discussion about um, ways to uh, maybe 
ropes or some kind of a, 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 a barrier. But I think, did, do I remember correctly that you didn't deem that feasible for this property? We continue to discuss it. Um, there's, there's two challenges. There's a, the, the business challenge that they go to feasibility, the business challenge, and then um, the, the egress challenge. So um, once you put up physical barriers around the floor, mm -hmm. it, we, have to re, we have to take a look at evacuation and egress from a fire code uh, emergency standpoint, and okay. it does create some, some challenges with our current design. So um, mm -hmm. both of those items um, have led us at, at this stage to, to try to focus on um, strategies other than physical barriers. Um, but we, it continues to be part of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was interesting is just kind of going back and looking at the incidents which we're basing the, uh, the civil penalty on. You know, the block that happened, you know, eight and ten days, all kind of fall around the Thanksgiving Day holiday. Right. All the ones, or a couple exceptions, you point to uh, the 14 and the four months, are all around the Christmas and New Year's holidays. So, I mean, you know, again, I don't know what kind of trend that, that points to, but that seemed to be where we were catching most of the folks. Um, obviously, and it was echoed here this morning, I think the most egregious cases is when somebody is physically at a table game facing one of your employees, and, you know, it was important to hear some of the steps you guys are taking to address that. Um, I guess I have a question for you, Director Wells, is kind of, you've assessed a penalty, what are your expectations or IEB's expectations kind of going forward with respect to how the licensee conducts itself? The expectation is that the licensee will uh, put forth additional resources to keep minors off the floor and keep minors from consuming alcohol. The priority um, from a regulatory perspective is the safety and well-being, as I said, of the most vulnerable. That includes uh, minors. And uh, if that means more security officers roaming the floor, if it means more personnel checking, then uh, the IEB's position is that's what needs to be done, that that's the priority. Okay. Director Wells, we heard conversation earlier today about um, parents uh, bringing um, uh, maybe 18, 19, 20 year olds um, and maybe assisting in their ability to, to gamble or at least being complicit or um, and some, some summonses that may have been recently issued. Do you have any more information yeah, I, about I don't that? Have any, and I don't have any specifics on that. I can check with the state police on what's going on with that, but um, I don't have anything for the you know, public consumption for the details of information on that. I know that the cut through walkway is now been, right. the, the minor access has been suspended or terminated. Originally that was a vote to ask to be exempted from the gaming floor, correct? Right. So, so is that status change or is this a temporary suspension? What is the status of that walkway? So it is now part of the gaming floor. Okay. So that minors are not permitted to be on that X, that crossway. Okay, so it's not a suspension. It's correct. To it's the entire done. thing being part of the floor. Correct. Okay. Any further questions for Director Wells? Well, thank you for your work. I want to add that um, <clears throat> Mr. Mathis uh, did indicate how much he appreciated the good work that you and your team did, and we know um, that it is a coordinated effort. Uh, we um, appreciate the fact that our licensee here has agreed to this and takes it seriously and has taken many steps that we've heard about today and we knew about uh, to address this issue that we know is somewhat of a unique challenge because of exactly what makes your property particularly special. So uh, thank you for your efforts in coordinating with the licensee. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Chairwoman, and I want to re reiterate our commitment. I also, without jinxing ourselves, want to report that our we held our inaugural meeting of our new weekly um, meeting to address minors and we reviewed reports and I'm optimistic based on what I've heard that you're, you're gonna see that when we're back in front of you, at, at least for May, 
um, there's a significant, that, that these measures are having impact and the numbers continue to go down. Um, it was a, um, a, a good discussion we had and the, the numbers look very good for May so far. So I think um, what we're doing is working and when we're here on our Q2 report, again, I'm optimistic that we're gonna see um, an impact from those. We look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Curtis for the Springfield uh, Service Employee Exemption Request. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in your packet, you'll see a request for three registration exemptions for MGM Springfield. And they're being presented to you for consideration and vote. The Commission staff worked with MGM Springfield, specifically Jason Randall, who's the Director of uh, Human Resources, to develop this recommendation is in agreement with the three positions contained in this packet. The three positions are an usher, warehouse runner, in the food and beverage hospitality internship program. So I'd ask Jason if he wouldn't mind explaining the positions a little bit more to the commission. Great, good afternoon. Uh, the three roles, the first role, the usher works in our entertainment division. Uh, this role will be greeting guests, checking tickets, uh, guiding to seats uh, at the symphony hall facility or events on the plaza and inside the armory. Uh, will not be engaged in any food service or alcohol service, so purely a, uh, escorting guests to to their seats. The uh, warehouse runner role is a is a uh, position on our property that uh, assists in unloading uh, trucks on the property and taking material from the loading dock to storage facilities and back of house, uh, or as needed, uh, taking product to the outlets directly. Um, the role does not cross the gaming floor. Uh, the only time it's front of house is when it's bringing product to our, Starbu our um, Starbucks um, and uh, hotel front desk. Uh, any of the other facilities that uses back of house service elevators. Um, with respect to transportation of alcohol, um, it's not um, opening any, any product, it's not dispensing any product, it's uh, just moving them around on, on uh, hand carts from from the, through the back of house area. And then the final role is the food and beverage hospitality intern. Uh, this is the internship program that we have is a 10 week program um, for college juniors. Uh, this position will be supporting the food and beverage team in an administrative capacity, uh, not performing any front of house or, or guest facing work, but really working on uh, projects for our food and beverage <coughs> internship team. Jason, the, the food and beverage interns, um, it sounds like from the descriptions that they are constantly supervised or wherever they go on property essentially during their that's, work time. That's correct. Yeah, okay. if, if anything, they're shadowing a, a leader in their environment, uh, but not performing the, the actual work with a guest. Okay. And what colleges do you hope to pull from? Uh, for, for the food and beverage intern, we have a student from UMass Amherst who's going to be fulfilling that, that role with us. Excuse me. Any questions? additional questions for Mr. Curtis or Jason? We'll just give you a little breakdown of the positions. It'll be 34 ushers, five warehouse runners, and then one um, F&B hospitality. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the Commission approve the request for the uh, three registration exemptions for MGM Springfield as included in the packet. Second. Any further questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Catherine five zero, please. The next item on the agenda is the Spring MGM Springfield alcohol permit amendment request, and I'll turn it over again to Mr. Curtis just to give you a briefing on that. Again, good afternoon. It is still <laughs> afternoon. I started with this morning when it was this afternoon, so thank you. Here we are. Okay, in your packet, you'll find um, the amendment form for the gaming beverage license that was originally um, approved on June 21st, 2018. Since that time, um, the licensee has approached us and it su has submitted this um, application for amendment to include four new um, outlets. It'd be the salon, the plaza bar, the 
food trucks on the plaza and the Casino Island Bar. Um, I'd ask Seth Stratton to just give a little bit more of a presentation on, on these four um, additional licensed outlets. I'll pass that actually over to Anthony Cardozola, who's our Vice President of <laughs> Hospitality, on, on three of them. Um, I'll do the trickier one, which I think is the um, Solana Spa, um, which I think is um, a, a modification of uh, what was previously included in our application uh, as being just um, the salon. We, we'd like to include the salon and spa. Essentially, this is a this isn't a frequent um, alcohol service, but it is um, in either spot. We like to have the ability um, when a customer requests it to serve a glass of champagne while they're having their salon or spa experience. Um, uh, anecdotally, in our experience, it doesn't happen very frequently, but it is an amenity that we like to be able to offer. And in our um, prior application, I believe we only included uh, the the salon and so we want to um, just clarify and clean up the areas the nature of the service um, and so that we're fully compliant with respect to the um, salon and spa and and again that that would be um, is there any other circumstance other than uh, a special event where we would have anything but champagne service in those spaces no, it would be strictly champagne, maybe a glass of wine. Really, we're going after the wedding market, and this is appealing to the brides. So this is something we just want to have the options to do. And then the other three areas, Anthony, I'll let you cover. Um, plaza okay. Bar. Food so the, the Plaza Bar is, is going to be our newest venue. It's going to be supporting um, MGM Live. Last year, when we started the Plaza Activations, we would do portable bars, notify the commission when we're going to do these bars, make sure we have the surveillance. This is more of a permanent structure that we felt we needed just to have um, more control over uh, ID checkpoints um, and, and the actual responsible alcohol service. The second one is with the two food trucks on our plaza. We currently run them Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, this will be beer only, no liquor, just to have the availability to sell beer if somebody orders food um, off of the truck. All the, uh, our normal procedure for tips, training, everything will take place. Um, it's nothing out of the ordinary from what we currently do. But you, you envision two, at least, the, are these the names of two of the trucks that would sell the... That is correct. The, there are two food trucks that we wholly own and oh. that we service. Um, this would not take place. We would not allow alcohol service from trucks from the outside. We would only confine it to our trucks just from a control standpoint. Okay, so those are the names of the two food trucks that That you is correct. Walk this way and Man Buns. Yep. Can I ask you what Man Buns serves? Asian style um, buns, lotus okay. buns. Okay. The trucks are there. They're, they're now currently there. Yeah, yes. if you want to take a look. They're, they're, in, they're permanently in the plaza during the season. Then the third would be our Casino Island Bar, um, which you see here. It's, it's 22 um, tabletop gaming devices. We're actually going to be moving Kino to this bar um, just to try to create activation. We've had great luck with Kino, so um, we think this would really just activate that whole back corner um, by adding this. Is this not included? You're not looking for two to four service here? It's uh, hmm. a very. There might be an error on this. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad you raised that. We would. We wouldn't. Or, or I'm sorry. Would you have the bartender? No. We we would do it currently, like just exactly how we do the walk up bar. So it'll be serviced by the cocktail waitress rather than a bartender. So it doesn't appear to be. It doesn't appear to be an open bar. So walk up bar. Um, which is our also our casino service, our, not casino, but our video poker bar. From 2 a.m. we shut it down, so there's no guest facing bartender, so there's no chance of a cash sale being being um, transpired from that. So same setup where a cocktail waitress, if they see somebody gaming, will go and it, during that 2 to 4 a.m. service, um, 
and service the guests. Okay. That's right, and I, I just flipped back to our original application, and the, it's the exact same as the casino walk-up bar, which also has the 2 a.m. window, but the gaming, uh, the gaming floor um, service is until 4 a.m., and um, so that service would be under that uh, license area. Okay. Is it a problem that it's physically removed from the gaming floor? It's not. It's, it's not. It's within. It's right. It's in within the, the confines of it. Correct. Okay. It, it is currently under construction. Is that? Is that true? That's right. It's yeah. we, we've created a false wall. It's be, the construction is. Uh, it's it's the quadrant of the slot floor that's closest to where we are now, the corner of state and main. So we've built a wall and cut off the majority of that quadrant while it's under construction, and then we'll, we'll mm -hmm. reopen it. So the the area was technically already licensed. It was you, now you have correct. You just have a new bar. Yeah, it's it's most it, it's it's um, I'd say almost identical to the walk-up bar, yep. which is within the heart of the gaming floor. is a separate licensed area that has different hours of operation. Once it shuts down, people can sit at the gaming devices at that bar and be serviced by cocktail service mm -hmm. uh, from the gaming area. I also have um, Angela Smith, who's the senior um, supervising gaming agent at Springfield. So if you have any questions for her about um, the service or anything like that, she can, she's available to answer any questions. Is there anything you want to add, Angela? Mm -hmm. I think they've covered it pretty well. <laughs> I, I have a question. The, um, sure. The, um, the new, we just learned about a lot of new policies that have been implemented with regard to to try to curtail the underage, um, are you seeing some some changes in? Um, do you, do you see the policies working regarding the underage on the gaming floor? Yes, I see a, a progression from opening through today uh, with with all the implementations that they've made along the way. Mm -hmm. Improvements with each implementation, mm -hmm. and and with the. Uh, with the bear docks at the security podiums that will be at the three standing posts. Mm -hmm. I think that'll be a tremendous help. And with the added training to table games employees, I think that'll be a, a big help as well. Okay. In your many years of um, working in other facilities, have you seen this from openings before where additional steps were needed to try to really get this issue under control? Or is it more about the porous I, th I think it's a combination. I've worked at uh, three different properties. Yes. Uh, one of the properties was a private casino. Mm -hmm. it, very strict on anybody entering, not just age limits. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't an issue there. But at the other properties that I've worked with, I've seen uh, it's, it's been an ongoing issue with underage on the gaming floor right. at all properties that, mm -hmm. I've, that I've worked at. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I will add that the two um, areas, additional areas, new bars, um, are obviously bars served by bartenders. I think um, when we talk about minor access, we have, as compared to gaming, which we talked about, we've had relatively few instances of minors consuming alcohol, and I think we have a very strong track record with respect to um, trained bartenders. I, I, I don't know of a single instance in which a bartender has served a minor at one of our bars. I, I think. Um, Bartenders are, are used to encountering this issue. They're very well trained. They're familiar with TEPs. And so I think these additional bars, I anticipate that we won't have any issues with, um, with minors being served by trained bartenders. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So that matter does require a vote with the, from the commission. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I move the uh, commission approve the amendment request to the gaming beverage license for Blue Tarp Redevelopment, DBA, MGM, Springfield for the Salon, Plaza Bar, MGM Food Trucks on the Plaza, and then Casino Island Bar. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 5-0, thank you. That concludes the matters from the EIEB. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm.
Ed has given me telling me to roll ahead. <laughs> I was I was simply yes. checking in with my fellow commissioners to make sure they were okay. Let's do it. All right, we'll continue on. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Director Vandalinden. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Um, I'm joined uh, this afternoon with uh, Christopher Bruce. Uh, Christopher is um, the Commission's uh, crime analyst examining um, public safety impacts of casinos in Massachusetts. Um, today he will be presenting findings from a report um, that it analyzes changes in police data following four months of activity at MGM Springfield. Um, this report builds upon a baseline that he released uh, last October. Um, that baseline included several years of, of data that were gathered and analyzed by Christopher. Um, and overall, this, this report and this element of the, the research agenda um, builds the body of evidence that tells the story of what are the true fiscal and economic impacts of expanded gaming in the Commonwealth. Um, the research that's conducted or led by the Commission is, is, um, is certainly um, the, the type of information that we need to inform our policies. Um, this is specifically regarding this report is the information that's needed to inform public safety strategies, data-driven policing. Um, and so to that end, it, it requires a very uh, unique relationship with, um, with the local police agencies in Springfield and the surrounding communities. Um, Christopher has a unique style, a unique approach to this. Um, I mean that in a very good way, Christopher. Um, he uh, works um, very closely with each of the, the communities. Um, he ties into their record management system and downloads the data from each, each agency. Um, he has an extensive process in which he analyzes this data, sorts and analyzes the data. Um, he uses not only that um, quantitative approach to analyzing the data, he uses a qualitative approach, um, which includes once we have a draft of this report, sitting down with each of the local police agencies um, as a group and asking whether or not this is, are we, on, are we on track? Is there additional information that you feel should be added to um, the report? Um, are we missing anything? And that, that is a, an important, a final but very important step in, in this specific study. Um, he's following, um, we are following a, um, the same methods that, that we've used in Plainville, um, and we've, we've launched the baseline study in Everett. So what you'll see, hopefully, over the course of time is a sort of consistent reporting of public safety data to the commission and to the local police agencies across the Commonwealth. Um, before I turn it over to Christopher, just uh, I, I, I would really like to thank um, Commissioner Cameron for um, your leadership in, in this specific study. Your expertise and background certainly lend to, um, lend to the, the credibility and depth and expertise of this, uh, this study. Um, and I also really want to thank um, the cooperation um, and engagement of, of all of the local um, agencies, Springfield and the surrounding communities. Um, I think that as I've described the methods and I think as Christopher will describe them, um, that cooperation is absolutely essential in order to get this study right um, and to get the data that, that we really need. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Bruce. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Um, this initial study just encompasses the first four months of MGM's 
existence. So it's really too early to establish any type of uh, long-term trend or anything. It's, it, basically, the purpose was to get a snapshot of, of any major increases uh, in any public safety issue uh, immediately after the opening of the casino so that law enforcement could be better prepared to uh, intercede with the right uh, tactics and, and strategies. Only after a few more reports will we have a, a sense of what, which of the increases that we've seen so far are, are going to become permanent, are going to become part of the, the long-term fabric of the, um, the associated communities. Uh, what we have seen so far, and again this cover, covers September through December of 2018, uh, first of all the, the casino itself uh, became sort of the top uh, hot spot of the, uh, the 11 community region. It reported more, more crime, more arrests, more calls for service than any other single location during that period. Now, uh, I'm, that may very well be warranted given the number of people visiting the casino. So if you take that total and divide it by the, you know, the number of visitors, the, the rate might end, end up being not all that spectacular. Unfortunately, we don't have that, uh, that level of data from all of the other locations in the region. But I, I want to caution that just because it's number one numerically doesn't mean it's, it's um, unsafe in, in, in any particular way. Any place that you know, gathers thousands of people is going to have a certain uh, volume of, of crime and, and calls for service. Um, within the surrounding communities, we've, we've seen uh, an increase in some property crimes uh, in uh, Springfield and in some of the communities to the south that I'll talk about. Uh, we've seen uh, an increase in traffic collisions and other traffic-related incidents uh, in mostly, to, again, to the south and the west of the casino. Um, we have seen uh, some increases in disorder uh, on the other side of the bridges in, in West Springfield. Um, and th that's really about it. Uh, I'll, I'll cover each of those things in, in detail. But overall, the, the, the numbers contributed by uh, MGM Springfield and the numbers contributed by the surrounding communities in any way that might have been a response to MGM Springfield weren't um, enough to create any general, generally large increases in the overall statistics for the region, if that makes sense. So if you were looking at the numbers by themselves, and, and we'll see a graph to that effect in just a second, you wouldn't really even notice that anything had changed um, for, for the 11 community region, which of course is a good thing. Uh, in the immediate area around the casino, as we're going to see, uh, the, the numbers have remained uh, fa fairly steady, which you know, sounds like it's not much of a victory, but we've You've added tens of thousands of new people a day uh, to the area, so th th that's actually quite good given the influx of, of visitors. Um, so, I don't know if you guys can even see anything that's on that. Oh, you, oh, oh, very we good, do. okay. And then we have it there too. Oh, excellent, okay, that's a, that's a relief, okay. So we've got 11 com communities participating in, the, in this study, uh, plus the state police, so 12 agencies total. And uh, I have a meeting uh, next week with, with the Amtrak police to try to get their uh, data and statistics to, uh, contributed uh, as well. Um, the population that uh, is represented by the region is about 410,000, 333 square miles, and a little over 1,000 uh, municipal police officers are contributing data to this, uh, this study. Just to set a little bit of context, you can see with the graphs in front of you here, um, over the last uh, decade or so, you know, Springfield uh, has historically uh, had a, a higher than average crime rate going back into the 80s and, and 90s. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, they've had a lot of success in, in reducing that, that crime rate. So MGM is opening here in 2018 against a backdrop of, of crime that's been going down for a, about a decade. You can see that's starkly true in, in terms of property crime. Uh, and that includes things like burglary, theft, vandalism, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, violent crime, which would include assaults and, and homicides and, and sexual assaults, had had a, a decreasing trend. It was starting to level off around 2016, 2017, but still a lot lower than we saw in previous decades. Traffic collisions, on the other, on the other hand, we're seeing a steady, uh, not sharp, but steady increase uh, over the same period. But that's what happens when you get more economic development to an area and more people start visiting an area. There's more traffic and therefore uh, more traffic collisions overall. Uh, here you can see the, the average of, of each year for the past five years compared to 
uh, 2018 when MGM opened, and you can see the moment that MGM opens there, th there's just, there isn't a bump, there isn't a tick, there isn't a blip on the, uh, on the overall uh, crime total for, for the region. So the, the changes that we're going to be talking about are sort of micro patterns uh, w within a volume that really just wasn't affected uh, in large degree by the, the casino so far. Now, the, the report is absolutely chock full of numbers, and, and I didn't waste your time here in this presentation by talking about those numbers that we analyzed and it turned out nothing was important or there was nothing related to the casino there. Uh, that's all in, in the full report if you want to read about that. But it is important that you understand what's happening with the numbers. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I had a methodology slide first, and I suppose I should cover that first. So, uh, as Mark talked about, we went to each of the communities, each of the, the police agencies. Uh, they agreed to let me tap directly into their records management and computer-aided dispatch systems, download the data for uh, since 2010 to both establish a baseline and then to compare what happened after, um, after MGM opened. Um, this is a unique project in that regard, uh, as uh, Commissioner Cameron has stressed numerous times, most studies in the past have only used aggregate crime statistics as reported to the FBI and not looked at calls for service that are not crimes and not looked at traffic collisions, uh, not to mention the detail that we get for each individual crime and not just uh, summary numbers. So it allows us to do a lot more than um, than studies in the past have if been I able could to do. Just yeah. jump in since you've mentioned. Um, you know, I think two things are unique. One is a baseline first, yeah. and we're not aware of any other casino related um, attempt to analyze crime that included a baseline. Um, and secondly, is the ability, and I again, when I talk about this project to this day, how did you get the police departments to turn over their data? That is sacred. They're not going to do that. And I think we did have a unique approach. First of all, we, uh, on the, on the um, advice of some, uh, one of the chiefs down in the Plainville area, recommending Christopher, be, so they trusted him. He, they had worked with him personally. So that helped us tremendously in, in getting police chiefs to buy into this project. You know, getting someone they trust, they have worked with, to, to, to say, okay, the word gets around, right? So you know all the chiefs from the Springfield area, they told me, oh, we called, we called already down to Plainville and I know this chief, I know that chief. And they said, he's good, you can trust him. So we're, we're good, we're gonna buy into this because of, um, because of Christopher's, your, your uh, reputation. You're giving me credit, I actually need to give you credit because you really um, have brought that to this project. And I think they understand we're working together. We want to, we all have, an, we, we all share this um, common goal of what can we do to keep it safe? What, how do we work together? Some of these uh, small communities do not have a crime analyst. So Christopher has offered with them, look, even if it's not related to the casino, if you need my help, you have a hot spot, you have a problem, I, I'm happy to analyze your data. Um, that was particularly true in the Plainville area. Up here, many, many, some of the agencies, what, what are the numbers here um, uh, of agencies that have a crime analyst and those that don't? Well, only Springfield does. Oh, yeah. well, so it's, 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 it's more important here, right? Because they don't have their own crime analyst to assist with crime. And again, I, um, I continue to be impressed with the, um, the level of support for this project. You know, the brainstorming that goes on, hey, what if this happens? What do we do about this? So it's it's really encouraging for me to see this level of cooperation that always doesn't, it doesn't always happen in public safety, right? It just doesn't. You know that as, as well as I do. So I just wanted to thank you and, and really point out how important it is that um, these, these agencies uh, trust you, trust your work, um, and they know you're not out to, you know, um, in any way manipulate the data, just, just a pure, this is it. We're going to report it out the way it is. Well, that's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, well, there is an understandable limit, though, to how much uh, they're willing to share. 
And so occasionally, uh, well, actually not uh, very often, when I see an increase in something, I have to go back to the agency and ask them for help in analyzing it. Right. So th they don't share personal information about any offenders or victims. They don't share the narrative of the police report. So there's a you know a limited amount you can get from the quantitative data. So whenever I see an increase, um, what I do is is look at what I you know look at the geography, look at the types of locations, the property uh, being stolen if that's what it is, time of day, day of week, anything, everything I can do from what the data. data that I have, but occasionally I have to go back to them and say, can you look at these 10 cases and tell me what's going on, because it's not clear from the, uh, the data that I have. And so, so a lot of the, the information in the report comes from feedback I get from the agencies after we've identified a trend. Now, the, in terms of the numbers themselves, um, I, I want to make it clear what's happening in, in the data tables in, in the reports, uh, because this is different from what I did in Plainville. In Plainville, things had been quite static uh, over the, the previous uh, five years. And so there wasn't really much need to build any kind of a, a trend factor into um, our consideration of, of what constitutes an unusually high volume after the casino ha has been opened. But here, since the, the trend, as we saw, uh, was significant decreases in certain crimes, you can't you can't base your assumption of what was likely to happen without MGM Springfield opening on uh, the same types of calculations uh, that you would use if the, the trend had been static over the years. So basically, I had to use different statistics if there was a sharply decreasing or increasing uh, trend and than I did if there was just sort of a flat uh, tr trend over the previous years. So this is an example here on, on the screen of a, um, you know, you know, these are just sort of random numbers over the past seven years, uh, and there's no trend. Uh, and so predicting what should have happened in 2018 and creating a window for what's a, a sort of a normal tolerance for, for crime is a matter of looking at the, the central tendency and, and, and the normal deviation and, and creating a, a window on, on either side. And I explain the statistics in a little bit more detail in the report itself. But here in this case, where the numbers have been going down uh, over the, those seven years, if I were to use the same statistics, I would be creating a window for basically where, where crime had been, but not where it was clearly going. Uh, over, over time. And so what I have to use is a different set of, of stats in order to create the, the appropriate window for a trend like this. So the data tables that you, you see in the, in the report tell you um, in, in the window type uh, column whether I used a, a statistics based on central tendency, no trend at all, uh, or based on uh, a, a trend. Uh, they tell you first of all what the previous average was per year. Uh, just for, again, this is just September to December, okay, not, not the whole year. So what was the previous average? What, what is the slope, meaning if you ran a trend line through the data, uh, what would be the, the average change uh, over the course of, of the seven years? If that slope is significant enough, it triggers the T instead of the C in the window type. Uh, and then the predictive window is basically, uh, based on that historical data, what would we have expected for a range for that crime or that call for service type in the, the four months at the end of 2018 with no outside intervention, nothing unusually, uh, nothing unusual happening to the region. And then for the result is what happened to that, or we, uh, sorry, we have the 2018 figures, and then the result is where, where were those 2018 figures compared to what we would have predicted based on that window. Now if that, if that result says high, then that, that's an indication that maybe something external yeah, by the way, that window is sort of an 85% confidence window, right? So only about 15% of the time would we expect the number to be outside that window unless some external influence had come along to cause that, that crime or that calls for service to exceed its window. That might be MGM, could be any number of other things, but that's my way of triaging what I need to analyze further. If that, if that result is high, then we gotta do some further analysis to find out exactly what's going on and can we tie it uh, to to MGM Springfield, and as to whether we can tie it, uh, you've seen this, this sort of Chris, matrix. Uh, yes. Can, can I go back? I'm sorry, you since know, you're changing. Um, please. Um, uh, if, if you could uh, please explain the, again, maybe you said this, uh, the window type, the C is the first one, the one that looks yes. horizontal. Yeah. And the T is the one that goes the down. Trend. Yeah. So in order to create the, the, the predictive window from, um, from a non uh, based on central tendency, I, I simply took the mean of the previous seven years and calculated roughly a one and a half standard deviations on either side of that mean. It might be around 1.7, whatever creates the 
uh, an 85 percent window, basically. So, but so it varies uh, the central or the decreasing. Yes. So if it varies I'm, according to the crime type. Uh, very yes, very very frequently yes. Some crimes were were showing a trend over the years. Others didn't show any trend at all. Okay. Yeah. And, so, when, and when there's a trend, it's uh, it's it's decreasing, or you just it could be either way. Straight, yeah, right? it could be either way. way. It, it, the slope tells you, right? So if the slope is positive, it means that it's oh. been increasing. If it's negative, it means it's been decreasing. And in those cases, I used um, I used the standard error rather than standard deviation to create uh, an 85 percent confidence window around the the predictive value for for 2018. Um, and if anybody's ever interested, I can provide the you know spreadsheets and the formulas so you can actually this is, this is plenty. Okay, see the, the calculations. Um, can I just end yeah, sure. So um, this this is this is a, an approach where you could take a look at what is the percentage increase or what is a percentage decrease, yeah. but it would be it, 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 this is a I think a better, more realistic way to try to take a look at at where there are increases and decreases because using a straight percentage could be deceiving it and yep. um, and not very helpful, quite honestly. Yep. No, I mean they're they're really useless. I mean the, the percentage change doesn't say anything about the normal amount of fluctuation you see in in that act, type of crime from year to year. So. Um, for some types of crimes, 5% is a huge change, and others it has to be 50% before it's, it's big. The, the, the confidence windows are a much better way to look at, at what... But, uh, but the trend you established over the past seven years, did yeah. I hear you correctly? Uh, for every agency except for Springfield, uh, based on Springfield's um, feedback to me, uh, they had done so much uh, with data cleaning starting in 2013 uh, that they felt that, that it would be misleading to, to go back... A, before prior that. that so I only used five years for Springfield right. and thus for the uh, any statistics that have the entire 11 community region uses just five years that's but that's yeah very that's, a, that's quite good but yeah it would have it, it would have been a different picture because they, they were over reporting a lot of their crimes back in in the early 2000 2010s and and therefore it would have it would have suggested uh, greater decreases um, than than we would have really expected if that makes sense so, um, so what I try to do then is establish a casino, any kind of casino relationship with uh, anything that we see increase. And, and these are some of the factors I look at. Is it geographically related to the, you know, close to the casino? Is it logically tied to the casino? Is there a reason that this crime would increase with the casino? Do we have any evidence of people uh, in the area specifically to use the, the casino? And, and sometimes it's... Um, uh, not direct evidence, but maybe you know, circumstantial evidence. There, there are more people coming from out of town, for instance, that are involved in this particular crime. Would be a sign that, that maybe the casino is uh, involved. Um, it, what else? Uh, oh, do we see the same type of increase across multiple crimes of a similar type, or are multiple communities reporting the same increase? The, the, you know, that would be stronger than if only a single community reported an increase in, a, in one odd crime. So I, again, I'll let you re read all of that um, or ask me any questions you have about that. But I've been using the, basically the same matrix since uh, Plain Ridge Park. And it's not a, it's not a, a, a quantitative uh, matrix. It's not like I add up the factors and then make a decision based on that. Because sometimes one factor is more important than the other depending on the type of crime. It's more of a, an evaluative of judgment. And, and I'm very cautious to say, to make a determination, especially in a four-month report, that an increase was likely or not likely related to Plain Ridge Park. I, or, I'm sorry, Tim, Jim Springfield. I, I, le I, left, I, I left some of it purposely vague just because we haven't established any kind of trend in, in just a four-month period yet. So my major findings are, are here, violent crime, property crime, total crime, they were all below average, which means that, that doesn't mean they were, they were lower than their expected window, but they were all below the average anyway, um, and, and within the expected ranges during the period across the communities as a whole. Um, the, if MGM Springfield wasn't here, uh, and therefore the crimes that were reported literally at this address, uh, were not uh, not reported. Cr Springfield would have had two percent fewer violent crimes, one percent fewer property crimes, and and two percent uh, fewer total crime uh, than than they actually did. Um, it was again the top crime and call for service location in the region, and in the surrounding area, what I thought was likely related were thefts from vehicles and other residential thefts um, at, at nighttime uh, south and and. Uh, east of MGM, which we'll, we'll show see a map of that in just a second. Um, an increase on collisions on some of the feeder roads, uh, increase in, in minor disorder incidents and suspicious activity, 
on the West Springfield side of, of the two bridges, and then uh, some incidents at Union Station in, in the immediate area, including thefts, uh, fights, and, and disorderly conduct uh, reports. And here's a map of the residential thefts of vehicles and miscellaneous thefts that we've seen in the region. These are only thefts at residences. So what we're seeing here are, at nighttime, uh, offenders going into vehicles parked in, in driveways or garages or, or you know, parking apartment parking lots, anything that's on residential property, and stealing things from the cars. Uh, it could be loose change, uh, cell phone chargers, you know, it could, could be just about anything. Uh, and also thefts from the common areas of those residences. So maybe an open garage or a bicycle stolen from a yard or uh, a parcel stolen from the front porch. None of the thefts would have involved entry to the residence because that would have been a burglary. So these are just, these are just uh, thefts. Uh, and so we saw an increase in both happening um, uh, all around. You can, the, the map shows dots all around Springfield, but the, the part that saw the largest increase was sort of that trail that you can see leading from MGM to the south and east, and then going into East Longmeadow, the very northern parts of East Longmeadow. And then the very northern parts of Longmeadow also saw an increase in the same types of crimes. Now, these are not unusual crimes for that region. Um, so what we're seeing here is not a brand new pattern. It, what it is, it's an intensification of something that, that's been going on for quite a while uh, in the, those communities. And the chiefs of East Longmeadow and Longmeadow have uh, both said to me that they'd gotten used to some of their, uh, the, the, those crimes sort of coming over the border from Springfield and just affecting the northern parts uh, of their communities. Um, I think there's a logical uh, relationship be between that type of crime. It's a, it's a type of crime you commit for immediate cash. Uh, so there's a logical relationship. There's obviously a somewhat geographic relationship, and it's definitely uh, worth watching uh, in the future. Um, you know, we'll see if it continues in, in the next uh, next couple of reports. Right, so about a two percent increase, correct? Yeah, uh, I, I don't I don't remember if I calculated the percentage change specifically on this one. Okay. But uh, it's it's seen within the uh, the statistics for those three communities. If you look at thefts from vehicles, and then other th miscellaneous thefts. Um, and then, uh, you know, I had to break it down by the type of location and so forth. Um, here is the uh, map of uh, changes in vehicle uh, in vehicle crashes by road segment. So it's a little bit ugly because it's it's done by uh, by street segment. But basically, uh, what it's looking at is just for the positives. So I didn't bother to do the negatives. Uh, if if a road segment had more crashes than the average, how many more? And then it's intensified by color. And thickness, and you can see quite a few right around the casino. It makes sense, obviously. More, more cars in the area, they're going to get into more crashes. I, I have made no attempt to do a rate calculation here just because I, I don't think the data exists, uh, or if it does, I, I would have to get it you know, on a repeating basis from the, uh, the city of Springfield uh, and all the other communities on, on how many, what the traffic counts are on those roads. Um, but, um, but, but it makes sense that more volume is going to lead to occasionally more crashes. In the area, you can also see some in the um, in the surrounding communities. Chicopee is not included on this particular uh, map. That uh, it's not that they didn't have any changes. I just hadn't gotten crashes from them at the time. Only in West Springfield and in I think Agawam did the numbers get high enough to trigger you know to go above that that window. But certainly we can see inter individual intersections. Uh, in, the, in multiple communities that might be worth some extra attention from the agencies um, because of the extra traffic. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I don't mean to, to suggest by this map or this analysis that any of the drivers are, are necessarily engaging in, in you know, improper behavior or anything. It's literally just a volume issue, I think. So is that, uh, are you saying that they don't involve alcohol. That was going to be one of my questions. No, uh, that's one of the more difficult questions to answer with Massachusetts data because we don't have a good. Uh, historically, we we did not collect uh, data on on alcohol involved crashes very well. Um, the only way I can really tell over the long term period as to whether a crash is alcohol related is whether the agency at the time of the crash uh, charged the driver with, with, with drunk driving. And that, they usually do. So it's, it, it's a, that, that's usually a, a, a decent uh, a data set. Um, so far, we haven't seen that. But anecdotally, I have heard a, a couple of cases in which somebody arrested for drunk driving um, has said that they came from, uh, from MGM Springfield. So while that doesn't seem to have caused an increase in a numeric increase in, in crashes, there, or there isn't a trend yet uh, 
that we can see with numbers so far, uh, it, it is happening a little bit. And so one of the things that was suggested from the um, meeting we had with the chiefs is that, I can't remember the agency, it's not the ABCC, somebody, somebody in, the, in the state that I wrote down and that I have back in my office uh, collects data on the last drink location. Uh, and they, they produce regular reports on that. So we need to do it. The Attorney General? Maybe that was the answer. On the last, I'm sorry. Uh, um, when, when in, uh, the last drink location. Oh, so specific. when somebody's arrested for drunk driving, they ask them, where did you have your last drink? Yeah. And of course, you know, you're, you're expecting people to volunteer you know, accurately that, that information. But um, regardless, that is recorded. And it's, um, it, there is a state agency that issues reports on that. And, and hopefully we can get into those reports. There's a bit of a delay on them, obviously. So I, I don't know if it syncs up with our release schedule perfectly. But uh, I'll try to incorporate that in the future future reports. This will be an important one to watch. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But, but so far, the, the total number of collisions with alcohol as a cause based on, on data collected, uh, based on what I said, with, um, charge, where we're charging the offender at the time of the collision doesn't seem to have increased. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then here we see a, a map of calls for service for uh, disturbances and suspicious activity um, in West Springfield. Uh, you can see that um, there are a number of, of hot spots just over the um, the bridges, and what, what we're hearing is that there's more there's uh, some panhandling going on along those those stretches of road. There's more people at nighttime going into a, a couple of restaurants, a Dunkin' Donuts, a, a couple of convenience stores, um, uh, gas stations uh, along both both stretches of road, and so that that's creating more of the, these calls for service, either from the businesses themselves or other patrons that are, are using those businesses. Unfortunately, being calls for service and not crimes, there's a limited amount, amount of data that exists uh, to identify exactly what's going on. So we're relying heavily on feedback from the West Springfield Police Department uh, on this particular issue. But in the future reports, I hope to get into the dispatcher's notes, uh, at least for um, this particular area, and, and to be able to tell more specifically what trends we're seeing in this area but it's definitely a, a numeric increase. Uh, West Springfield also had this little pattern of purse snatchings alongside uh, Riverdale Street um, uh, over the four month period. It was, it's a very unusual crime for West, it's very unusual crime for anybody in the region, uh, but uh, particularly West Springfield. And um, when I, I was able to go to the agency and look at the individual reports, uh, they didn't seem to be related to the same offender. I thought it might be a series at first where we had one offender who was committing multiple purse snatchings. But after I read the reports, they all seem to be um, different offenders, but it's still a, a pattern and something that's not, not usual along that road. So um, that's, again, definitely something we're going to keep monitoring. It's only five incidents, so it's not enough to trigger any you know, huge changes in the data. But we look for these micro patterns as well as, as the broad trends as well. And the, the other things I'll note is that Union Station saw a 62% increase in crime uh, um, from, from its average, um, and, and those include you know, fights, um, and disorderly conduct, and, and some thefts. Uh, now, Union Station uh, you know, had been going some, undergoing some renovations. It was closed for a while. So the historical data includes some periods in which it wasn't open, which uh, is obviously going to affect uh, that. Uh, but we really need the, the Amtrak data to, to get a bigger picture of what's happening at the station and on the uh, on the train uh, to and from the station. Uh, Chris, Amtrak was receptive to participating in the project? Surprisingly so, yeah. The, they immediately got back to me when I wrote and, and right. we, we've scheduled a meeting for, for next week. And uh, right. yeah, I, I, I think that it's actually not going to be a problem at all. We had keep hypothesized. In, oh, sir, yeah, yes. just keep in mind, um, Union Station is actually now the consolidation of the yeah. former bus station, right. Amtrak services. So, you know, the pockets of what might have been happening at those previous operation sites might yeah, very true. set a good benchmark for you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll you know, I, I might be a little bit ignorant of some of the geography, so I'll talk to the uh, um, crime analysis unit here from future reports to see if there are other addresses that I should have been including in my assessment of what Union Station was before the, um, before the change. Um, we had hypothesized that maybe there would be some uh, increases in crime at local hotels, uh, not, I'm sorry, crime calls for service, you know, everything, at local hotels, restaurants, gas stations, places that would be likely used by, by patrons of, of the casino. Um, and, and not again, just because not because they're bad people, just because when you increase volume of, of people, you increase uh, crime typically. Uh, but so far, that hasn't happened. So we, we other than um, 
a couple of isolated uh, places uh, that had other explanations. We, we really haven't seen a general increase in, in hotel or restaurant or, um, or other service type of, of location crime. Again, we'll keep watching that. I spent a lot of time put, creating maps of exit radiuses uh, in each community. Uh, so you get off the highway here and there's you know, a radius around which people, you know, we might see an increase in activity just because of people coming and going. So far that hasn't produced anything. Um, Did, were you able to determine that in fact all of the entities that you were thinking of or looking at actually experienced increase in patrons or people? No, no there's, yeah, the, I mean, it's I'd have to. It's an assumption. Yeah, exactly. It's an assumption. That, that would have been a good thing yeah. to know. Okay. Right, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, that's based on a sequence of assumptions, right? That, that first of all, these hotels are, are going to see an increase in patronage, and therefore they, they'd have an increase in crime. I'd have to call them individually to, to see if they if they had an increase in, in patronage. I think I would do that if the reverse happened. So if I saw the if crime, saw the yeah, exactly. The, the, Fair enough. Then sure. try to get their input on that, like we did with um, uh, the premium outlets in, in Rentham, uh, mm -hmm. when we saw th their crime go up. Um, well, although it would be interesting to know in the it, absence, where there's an absence of crime too, if there is additional yeah, traffic. Yeah, that, no, that's a really yeah. good point. I, um, and, and you know, I wouldn't want to do that every few months, but uh, certainly after maybe a, a year or something, it, it would be interesting to see if we could get maybe the, those figures from, uh, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know. I, it is a the convention bureau or something like that. You know, might might collect uh, fig, those types of figures and make it easier so without having to call every. Yeah. Well, I know, hotel. and I know that we're thinking of economic developments. So yeah. <laughs> right. Or if it could be leveraged or triangulated with some other aspects yeah. of our yeah. research agenda through the economic um, studies that are being carried out by the Donahue Institute. But um, I think that there there are certainly ways that we could we could try to leverage other parts of our research. Right. Your research. That's a good suggestion. We'll, we'll look into that. Um, and the final thing I'll just mention is that I did some analysis in the report of the area directly around MGM to see what had happened. Uh, again, four months isn't a lot, and it was, you know, four cold, you know, uh, mm -hmm. short months. So I, I, I don't want to draw any broad um, uh, conclusions about that until we've had a year's worth of activity at least. But so far, right around MGM, the immediate block uh, ha has a, has only, they saw a slight increase in thefts from vehicles and vehicle theft, but the numbers were small. So they were outside the range, but we're talking like single digit numbers there. Um, the Metro Center in general, the, the numbers were pretty flat uh, across the board, uh, which is, you know, really saying something when we're talking about an influx of, of tens of thousands of visitors. But of course, an influx of people means a couple of things. First of all, you have more potential targets, uh, so that could increase crime, but you also have more potential guardians. So that, that tends to decrease crime. So uh, it, it, so far, it, the best um, guess, uh, my best guess is they're canceling each other out, basically. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. we're just seeing no changes in, in activity well, at all. And we talked about this briefly earlier today. Christopher, one of the, um, you, when we, we got together and really started talking about the baseline and the project moving forward, all the chiefs, you know, really interested in what would, what would happen. And we did talk about that, the fact that there would be so many more police officers, the Metro unit, uh, the Gaming Enforcement unit, um, and we talked about the possibility of disbursement. And the chiefs were really interested. I wonder if they'll come over the bridge, I'll get it all in West Springfield or other parts of Springfield. And I know you were conscious of looking at that and that that hasn't happened. The disbursement piece hasn't happened. And we had interesting conversations, you know, are these uh, criminals basically lazy? They're not going to walk a half mile to commit the crime. And you had statistics from other projects you had worked, which basically say it doesn't happen as much as right, the, we think it, or, or someone thinks it might, right? right? The, yeah, the summary of, of criminology or literature is basically the displacement is feared a lot more than it actually occurs. Right. Uh, ju just because the original environment was uh, conducive to crime in for particular reasons and you make that unavailable and it's there is no instantaneous adaptation to, to new environments uh, a lot of people simply fall off uh, mm -hmm. criminal activity altogether uh, or, or they do adapt but at lower volumes than, than in the original location mm -hmm. so uh, the fact is there's just there's no other area around here that's quite like Metro Center Springfield mm -hmm. that if you were interested in committing uh, the same crimes you used to commit around here that you would immediately go to. Uh, you'd have yeah. to research and, and go to places that are much less uh, 
amenable to whatever you were doing. Uh, so it, it makes sense that we're not we're not seeing that. But I, 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 again, I don't want to I don't want to say for sure that we're not seeing it until we've we've had too soon. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We've had more data. So, and that is my report. Yeah. Any other questions for me? Well, I mean, I think all of us didn't know what to expect, right? We, we were hopeful that all the efforts, everybody working together would be successful. So I, I actually look at this as, you know, a good report so far. We don't see, uh, of course, we see certain things we have to pay attention to, but we don't see an overall, really, escalation of criminal activity. So I think that's, that's the good news so far. And uh, it, will, it will take everyone's vigilance to keep, to keep at it, right? Mm -hmm, right. And obviously, as the the, year, uh, the months progress and we have more reports, uh, yes. you know, eight months, 12 months, et cetera, I'll be able to incorporate more data sets, mm -hmm. including some yeah. comparative data from other agencies. I'll create control areas the same way I did for, um, for Plain Ridge Park and, and so forth. But and the summer months will be interesting. Yeah, the, and that'll be yeah. interesting, too. So yeah, expect them to get longer and, and you know, a little more detailed, obviously, yeah. as, they, as we go forward. Right. Well, one of, one of the things that I know um, happens as a matter of just the process that, that we're undertaking, or at least has the potential to happen, is for some of these feedback quickly loop back to the Public Safety Committee that, right. that, that you are part of, yes. uh, Commissioner, and get the feedback from an input critically yeah. uh, from the chiefs to develop uh, brainstorm about strategies or tactics. Well, yeah, and that's focus. already happening, right? The, yeah. the chiefs have already talked about, oh, I didn't realize you were having that too. I, you know, I, I had this here. Let's talk about if it could be the same group or whatever. So that is happening. Um, yes, now that we have um, more data, more information, the Public Safety Committee is very interested in Christopher's work right. and, and um, how they can help assist with this project. So mm -hmm. that's a good point. Thank you. If I could say, so this is the four-month report, and I think it, it's largely because we're very curious um, and want to, to keep track of any increases that we may see immediately after the opening of MGM Springfield. We'll continue on this, this interval. Mm -hmm. um, uh, eventually, I think that the, the reports would be less frequent once we begin to have a better sense of, of what we need to pay close attention to, but we're, we're um, adaptable, and, and we can do these at the... Uh, at a frequency that makes sense and, and would be useful to the commission and to the local agencies. And, and Director Vanderland, and I credit you with, um, you know, you're a, you're a public health person and very much interested in the responsible gaming pieces, but you have embraced this project <laughs> and given it all of, the, all of your time and effort and um, really um, taken the ball and, and been a great leader, frankly. I mean, I may have some expertise, but you've been the lead and, and you've done it really well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. So, item six, we met yesterday. Have there been any updates that you want to provide since then or any others that you would like to provide? We are here pretty much alone, but in open meeting forum. <laughs> Anything? Um, we had a meeting of the Public Health Trust oh. Fund um, at, uh, yesterday, and um, uh, some of what um, what came out of that meeting, I think I should come back and report to this commission. Um, I think one of the things that occurs to me um, right away uh, is as we think of the next year's budget that will be coming very soon, uh, because it's the end of the fiscal year. Um, that some of the um, some of the highlights from yesterday's meeting we could we could frame around the discussion of the budget. So I will be coming back um, and update you all on some of those developments. Thank you. And I do know that you'll be working with Commissioner O'Brien to help to transition her in to public safety the, for public the safety. Yes. So this is a good kind of a junk, good juncture to make sure that that transition helps because, of course, um, you, you two bring a different perspective, so it'll be really a, a good, good transition, so thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Any nays? Great. <laughs> Five zero. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <sighs>